This is the D6 Generation with your hosts, Craig Gallant. No, no, no. Cut that. Keep that. Someday it's going to be worth something. Russ Wakelin. You put me in an ATST with freaking Wookiees attacking me and whatnot? Now you're talking. And J.J. Layfield in the third chair. And this is the end. With contribution from Total Fangirl. Vampires do not sparkle. And our loyal listener. Are you crazy? That's like 400 hours of gamer nonsense. Welcome to another edition of Rapid Fire, the roundtable discussion of all things gaming. Coming to the speed of a bunch of electrons rushing through a state-of-the-art data network like a sea otter named Salt. Today's what? edition is brought to you by all of our friends at Patreon who help us keep the lights on. This time around, it's James Martin, Jason, just Jason, Jason Ford, Jason Harms, and Jason L. Fernandez. I'm Geekly McNard and your host today. Our panelists are Russ Quaff Wakeland and Global Guild Ball Gold Globe Trotter Tournament Toreador and the world's and radio originator other half, JJ Locust Layfield. Let's begin. Issue number one. Data dissemination is the distribution or d- transmission of statistical or other data to end users. There are many ways organizations can release data to the public, i.e. electronic format, CD-ROM, <laughs> and paper publications such as PDF files based on aggregated data. Question. The SMDX is a standard used to ensure that statistical data sent around the world follows a unified format. What does SMDX stand for? Regression fallacy, Russ. Uh, Simply my data. Wrong! Joint probability, JJ. Syntax metadata? Oh, so close. Wrong! Statistical data and metadata exchange. Mm. Come on, guys. I started with a softball here. (laughs) Issue number two. Salute. The UK's premier miniatures convention has been held in London for decades. A chance for companies big and small to show their wares to their UK fans and for fans to gather to discuss their favorite topics, tactics, and techniques. It is heralded as the wargaming destination in England and has been held for more than 35 years. Question. On what day of the month do the South London Warlords, the game group that runs Salute, host a large participation game to introduce new members of Ingo- and give old ones a chance to try something new? Robert Ross Russ. The first full moon of the month. John Jervis JJ. The first Sunday of April. Oh, last Monday of every month. Come on! They meet every Monday and eight Saturdays a year for extended fun. But I mean, come on! Issue number three. (laughs) In any human endeavor, there are as many ways to do something as there are people trying to do them. When we discuss getting new, ever-evolving information to people, or in fact, whether we should even try, we hit the very core of a game company's need to keep their product current and vital. Too little, and a game bloats and stagnates. Too much, and... How often should a game company update its models, stats, rules, and interactions to keep the game fresh and new? Ravana Ross. Every three years. Jellyfish JJ. Twelve months. Wrong! Both of you! Constant! It's the Matrix, baby! (laughs) Wait, why wait? Instant gratification and always playing in the now! Issue number four. Keeping a schedule of annual updates to a game and structuring them like seasons of a competitive sport is perfect for a sports game like Guild Ball. Letting a company tweak rules and make adjustments to the global meta on a regular basis means that a player is constantly working on new information and models, but has time to build a sense of the game before any drastic changes occur. Question. Given that at SteamCon the next guild was revealed, what will that guild's theme song be? Rutabaga Russ. Uh, I've got a lovely bunch of potatoes. Jalapeno JJ. Uh, Summer 69 by Brian Adams. <laughs> we are farmers. <laughs> bum, ba dum, dum, bum, bum, bum. Wrong! <laughs> That's it for now. Look, for here, look to hear regression fallacy Russ in the future. Thanks for listening and good night. This episode of the D6 Generation is brought to you by Battle Foam, protecting your army so you don't have to. And the War Store, bringing the war to your door since 1999, and that is for a decade or more. Hello! 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 Hey, and welcome to episode 205. That sounds like a room in an academic building. It does. Of the D6- Go to room 205, please. Right, right. For the D6 Generation 101, I'm Russ Wakelin. I'm Craig Glad. And I'm JJ Layfield. Hey, JJ. Oh, good job, JJ. <laughs> it's, welcome to the show. It's very exciting to have you here. Uh, JJ, of course, uh, former uh, co-host of World's End Radio and gaming tournament player extraordinaire and international man of globetrotting, Indeed. right? 
<laughs> well, true. I've never heard it described like that, but I'll take it. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you for coming on the show. We're excited to have JJ here today, of course, uh, with an international tournament player such as JJ. We thought we would talk about many things, right, Craig? Oh, absolutely. But the man's been around the world. He has. So we would... We thought it'd be great to literally, talk. literally, literally, like actually yeah. circumventing the globe. Yeah, in a balloon. Circumventing, no, <laughs> circumnavigating in a balloon. And you know what? Less than 60 days. Yeah, yeah exactly. There's a book yeah. and everything, right? It was yeah. awesome. <laughs> but uh, we thought, you know, since Jade has been in the miniature industry for a long time, playing lots of games, covering it for a long time, it would be great to talk a little bit about how technology has changed how games and specifically their yeah. rules are delivered. So we talk a lot about And we that. should say that his cranium is full of secret information about Guild Ball that we'll, we, we will constantly be prying at. And if uh, the past is any indication, completely fruitlessly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. Good. So we'll, and we'll talk a little bit specifically about what's changed in Guild Ball Season 3 now that the three of us have had a chance to get a few games under our belt. And we'll talk a little about what's different yep. about it, what we like, and what you should watch out for. So all that's coming up. Uh, but before we get to all that, Craig, we have mm. a couple things we should probably cover. And one of those is, you know, we did meet up with JJ in uh, Dunkin' Donuts. Through in the, the Galactic Dunkin' Donuts. Through the magic of Dunkin' Donuts instant teleportation, which is a pretty cool technology. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. JJ, do you remember what we covered? Proprietary. Yes, it is. Do you remember what we talked about? Where we there? We, we, well, we spoke a lot about peanut butter. <laughs> there, there, there was <laughs> much talk of peanut butter. There was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we also spoke a lot about international conventions and uh, the differences between, what, Australia, US, UK, all those sorts of regions and how it all works. Exactly. Yep. So if people want to listen to that amazing discussion, uh, which includes a bit of peanut butter, uh, Craig, mm. what should they do to, to get that information? Uh, they should listen to you next. <laughs> you just, I, yes. So what you should do is head on over to... The I'm music. rubber, you're glue. Whatever you say to me <coughs> bounces off me and sticks to you. This is why we normally don't record at 6 in the morning. <laughs> so anyway... Yes. Uh, so, don't make me wake up before 6 a.m. or this is what you get. <laughs> right. So what we what we'd ask you to do is go to the d six generation dot com in the upper right hand corner you will see a little button that says Patreon. Click on that button and that will take you to our Patreon page, in which you can help our show by donating a little bit of money to each episode. And if you do become a patron of the show, you will gain access to the Lost Chapters, amongst other great rewards. And the Lost Chapters, of course, are a great way to listen to extra content. You know, the first four hours are free, we get you hooked, and then we give you an additional half an hour or so every other week of crazy Lost Chapter content. Right? Yeah. So Indeed. there you have it. But uh, what's it time now for, Craig? Uh, it's now time for... Achievements in Gaming! Oh, that was a very quiet achievement. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I was doing, I didn't even mess with that at all. Audio fail there. So Achievements, of course, is brought to us by all of our great <laughs> patrons over at Patreon. Uh, so what have you been playing lately, JJ, in the world of uh, miniature or board games? Uh, so, well, I guess recently it's been a lot of Guild Ball, um, you know, new season. So got to try everything out. A lot of Guild Ball. Uh, so I played... Well, in the last couple of weeks, probably pushing about 12 games now. Um, but that's, <laughs> yeah, it's been a bit hectic. Uh, but lots of new things to, to try out, so that needs to be done. Um, but then backing up the end of those sessions with a couple of quick games of Dominion and things like that, which nice. have been really good. Uh, get that game back out. It's been sitting on the shelf for too long. Uh, then over sort of Christmas New Year period, I was back in Perth, oddly enough. Uh, so had a bit of a good session with Luke and the rest of the guys down there. So had some, played a game called Cash and Guns. You guys ever played oh, that? Oh, yes. Indeed, that is a lot of fun. That is I'd fun. never played that before. What'd you think? Uh, it was it was interesting. <laughs> it was, I mean, that particular gaming group that, that Luke and I, well, Luke's still a part of. I'm not because proximity. But <laughs> we're, we're a terribly vindictive bunch, Ooh, yeah. uh, which in that game doesn't tend to play out terribly well when everyone dies simultaneously. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wow. So we got to we got to a point where we started just using the uh, using the bullet cards mm -hmm. randomly. So we just shuffled them up and then just started flipping them at random because it just otherwise just Luke or I died like on the first turn every <laughs> single game. So wow, <laughs> that that was a thing, <laughs> but a lot of a lot of fun. Um, got into some Eldritch Horror, Horror and Settlers Catan down there as well, and uh, was back at my mum's place staying there actually. So I found my old Space Hulk set, so I pulled that out and actually gave my mum. After, you know, having sat in the house with my brother and I and all of my mm -hmm. friends 
around at our place a fair bit playing war games. Got her to play her first miniature war game after 23 years of putting up with it. Wow, really? Uh, so I got her to play Space Hulk with my brother and I a that couple of wild. times of an evening, which was nice. Um, that is indeed an achievement. Yeah. I don't know if I've ever heard that accomplished before, Luke. I mean, JJ. No, that's very <laughs> impressive. That's really amazing. So, so yeah, yeah. I look, see... He's so he's oh did you did you just hear that oh they all sound alike to me oh my god that's just so judgmental <laughs> it's what a six bigot in the morning Australians <laughs> oh, they all sound the same to me but JJ just plug it, one in I, unplug them plug another one in whatever it work right just make it work wow <laughs> um, but and then a lot of this I, I guess you guys have probably played the game Bananagrams yes no I have not yes I have that's. It's a good family game, right? It's it is, um, yeah. just basically you have your own, like there's a set of tiles in the middle and you have to build your own Scrabble board essentially and it's sort of a, a race yeah. to build up a network of words with whatever letters you randomly draw. Uh, Are they all, all shaped like bananas? No, but the bad No, but, you know, every time you, every time you finish your grid, when there's more yeah. letters in the middle, you say peel and everyone has to take another letter. And then oh. add that to their grid and then you, at the end, you yell banana, which is great oh, cool. when you play it in a cafe. <laughs> uh, you know, you're sitting down in the, in the cafe, like next to the beach, playing with your family and everything. And then randomly, like your little I cousin will just yell banana really excitedly. Yeah. Which is which is always good fun. Right. Or good. if you play in a room where that new Google voice activated thing is because you're just going to find a bunch of bananas start showing up at your door the next day. That would be amazing. Next to next to the fridge, just like yeah. oh, and with the Amazon one hour prime delivery, it's just like banana, and then like banana. Alexa, it's got like banana. four hours of bananas. <laughs> be awesome. Amazing. I mean, it's better than dollhouses. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're easier to store. That's for sure. That's right. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I've been up to. Cool. Nice. That's that's amazing. I you got to get double achievements for your mom playing Space Hulk. Now, did that, she like that, it? That's actually yeah. That's did some she, kind of meta achievement. Did she enjoy the game? Did she want to play again? Uh, yeah, we, twice. Got to play, we got her to play twice. We played the first mission, one yeah. with her being the Terminators. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then she was like, no, I like the idea of the big alien thing. So we're like, all right, cool. <laughs> cool. Switch it around, play the first mission again where she was the Gene Steelers. And yeah, so we got her, got her to play the first mission twice. Which is good. Well done. That well is, done. That is awesome. Russ, Thank how you. about you? What have you been playing? Uh, well, uh, much like JJ. So you got the name right there. Uh, much like JJ, uh-huh. I've been playing a lot of Guild Ball. So uh, three games yep. of Guild Ball I played uh, against Blake, who is... Uh, well known as one of our um, extremely good uh, miniature yes. gamers in the area. Ex- extremely good is kind of putting it mildly. Yes, and I, I lost to Blake, but uh, only by a few points. So that was pretty good. I was proud Which, of myself. Hey, even scoring against Blake is an achievement. Yes, so yes, give I, yourself one of those. I did. I, there was a moment where I was ahead for a brief moment. Uh, and then really? um, I played against Greg, who is a uh, very, very adamant Guild Another Ball fan. Another very good player. Uh, very good. I also lost to Greg, but I oh. um, I also managed to score points there, too. So I was feeling very good excellent. about that game. Well done. And then I Two played, excellent achievements. Yes. And then I played against Craig and How'd got that go? skunked. I didn't even score a point. I got nothing. Zero to 13, JJ. It was, yes, well. it so, was awful. So what you're saying is, is Craig is the... the Better of the three players you played Clearly, against. Clearly, by the yes. law of continuity. I mean, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's a logical fallacy there somewhere, but yeah. we're going to run with it. Yes, by the, uh, by no, the law yeah. of transit not, gaming. No, by, yes. by Russ's law, I'm not better than Blake and Greg, but I could easily score against both right. of them. You've currently beaten them <laughs> by the transit properties of gaming. You've beaten them both. and now, No, I haven't beaten them because you didn't beat them. No, no, it's right. You've lost. Yes, yeah, you've lost. You would have had them. to be that, but I, I lost very close games to Blake and Greg. Yes, there you go. Technically, See? technically. Yes, technically, right. <laughs> By some strange metaphysical right. law of Russ's. In any case, you are much better than me, which is a thing to take away here. But I'm really liking the game, whether I win or lose. Well, it's all what... about the timer, though. It is. I've used the clock it's... in all three games, yes, and I love it. I think you have to play with the, with the yeah, game it's clock. It's a totally different game with a clock. I agree. JJ, do you play with the timer? Almost exclusively yeah i think you have yeah um but i also play on a reduced timer i play on like a 35 minute not a 45 Ooh, minute look at you really oh uh, yes. i don't play with the 45 Show i play off. 33 oh, <laughs> oh here we go again oh any accent even any anglicized accent will flit right in there let me just give a r- random generic english like accent oh ross <laughs> Anyway. We we have a genuine globetrotter <laughs> on the show, and you're just showing yourself to be this I provincial am, little I, guy. Yes, <laughs> I apologize, JJ. This is embarrassing. It's all right. It's all right. I'm Australian. We're used to racism. All right. <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway. Oh, that went weird. Okay. <laughs> All right. Also, Noted. Done. All right. Moving on. So and that's what I'm playing on game nights. But also uh, on New Year's Eve, we had uh, good friends over the Carlson. So we played board games in the evening. They're big board gaming as well. So uh, whilst the kids just hung out, we, we played board games. Um, we, we broke out. Uh, first, we played End of the Line, which I felt was really appropriate. For those who are not familiar with End of the Line, the... <laughs> The, uh, it's, a, it's a great end of the world game. So I figured <laughs> yeah. on New Year's Eve, what better way to ring in the new year than it's the end of the world. So we played that. Uh, they really enjoyed it. We all had a good time. Then we broke out. Um, you know, it's New Year's Eve. You're going to stay up late. You might want something a little light. So we broke out Camel Up. And I have to say, we played that game again on Christmas Day with my brother and, and my sister-in-law. We played that three times back to back. And again, on New Year's Eve, we played it three times again. Boom, boom, boom. Right back to back. Wow. We're loving it. And the... The uh, the third time we actually broke out the expansion, which I realized I had but had never used before. Have either of you played uh, with Camel Up with the expansion? I have never played Camel Up. Really? No, I haven't played it with the expansion at all. Okay. No. So uh, to, for those who may not remember, Camel Camel Up, or it's actually called Camel Cup now, due to a interesting printing error on the, <laughs> uh, or maybe it was always Camel Cup. Any, in any case, it was uh, always Camel Cup. It was always Camel Cup. But the way yes, it's any, yeah. anyway. So it's a game about racing camels. But the interesting thing is you don't actually play a racing camel. You play someone betting on the camels. And the really cool part about this game is that in the center of the table is a giant cardboard pyramid with an interesting uh, rubber band sort of sliding door mechanic. And all these dice go into the pyramid that are different colors. And each color is color-coded to a wooden camel, camel meeple racing around the track. And you turn the pyramid upside down, push the little lever, and one and only one die falls out. Uh, with a number facing up, and that's how far you move that particular colored camel. So you're really kind of betting on which camel's going to finish first, second, and third in a particular leg of the race, and then on the overall winning winner and losing camel. And it's all about how much money you can accrue by the end. What's interesting about the what's interesting about the game is it's really easy to teach, a lot of fun to play. It's one of those simple games with a lot of good uh, decision making depth. Uh, but what I really like about it is it plays eight players right out of the box, which is great. So on a night like that, you, can, you have plenty of people you can play. The expansion takes it to ten players, but the expansion adds a couple cool components, one of which is the camel currently in last place gets an extra special die into the pyramid. So it allows the, camp, the last place camel to get a better chance of catching up, which keeps the game a little more uh, difficult to predict, which you want in a good gambling game. Uh, and the second thing the, the expansion does is it adds a giant cardboard-constructed camera uh, it looks like one of those old 1930s sort of, you know, accordion camera things. Uh, and that is an additional way to put on the board, like the traps, to uh, predict where the camels are going to end up and get some extra money by taking good photos of camels in a stack. Because the other interesting thing about this game is that the camels actually, when they're on the same space, they stack on top of each other, uh, which is just an interesting little mechanic as well. Fantastic game. I cannot re- recommend it highly enough. Great filler, as well as a great family or, or uh, gateway game. Um, and some of the best components and really fun mechanics. So camel oh. cup or camel up, depending on, you know, how you want to call yeah. it. Yeah. So Works either way. That was all. It really game. does. What about, what about you, Craig? What have you been playing lately? Uh, well, let's see. I've continued. Uh, Karen continues to really enjoy Vikings on board as a, one, as a two player game. Mm-hmm. So that was, uh, so we got another game of that out. Uh, she, she beat me. It came down to the third tiebreaker. So that was good. That's always a good game. Uh, and then um, uh, our friend Joe called a uh, a meeting of the guys like at the last possible minute, um, and he uh, decided to have it at my house. So that was intriguing. <laughs> and so we played uh, Vikings on board at it was bad. It was bad. It was I haven't done this in a while. This was we started Vikings on board at 11 o'clock on a school night. Ooh, and so uh, nice, nice idea. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, well, I mean, it's a quick game. So we were done by like twelve fifteen, I think. But um, uh, it's uh, it reminded me again of how different the game is between a four player game and a two player game. But in a two player game where you get to make all your choices and you've got a lot more options and then in a four player game where all that's cut in half. So it's a lot harder to predict what's going on. It's a lot more important about the bets because you have no real control over which ship's leaving uh, unless you get first turn. So that's a fun game. I still love that game. Uh, But the uh, winner of that whole night was Colt Express that we played four times. Nice. And uh, that was awesome. We played a couple games with just the basic rules and the horses. Never without the horses anymore. You got to have the horses. Al- always with the horses. Got to have the horses. And then we introduced all of the special rules, but not the stagecoach. And then we introduced all the rules together. 
And uh, that was just a blast. Um, I, I, I had my highest scoring game of Colt Express ever wow. when I managed to get the banker and the stagecoach strongbox. And I was going to just kind of hang out on the stagecoach and hope for the best. And then everybody kind of got bottled up in the back of the train and the sheriff was right behind them. So I jumped back onto the train, ran to the front and got the st- and got the engine strongbox also. So scored over 3000 points. Wow. 3000. So that that's amazing. Yeah, it's good. Yes. Uh, it's pretty impressive. All uh, on a school night. I'm a, I'm a pretty big all deal. All on yeah. a school night. Exactly. All on a school night. <laughs> Does it get any better than that? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know the quality of the education I was given out the next day, but boy, <laughs> did I have fun. <laughs> uh, Dave's Rogues D&D session. We had that another one of those with Rafe and the guys, and that was a lot of fun. It was a social uh, environment this time. We have... Uh, infiltrated the big mansion we snuck in through the basement workshops of the crazy wacky mechanically inclined son fought a bunch of his uh mechanical monstrosities as i discussed last time and this time we had uh made our way up into the big giant rich person party and had to navigate the uh the social um tides and uh currents of uh water deep so that was fun Cool. Uh, that was uh, because my guy is, uh, although he's an assassin, I put most of my focus on social interaction skills. So that was a lot of fun. And I managed to get up to the uh, the host of the party who was on the third floor uh, in a private room. I got to him first while everybody else was trying their own various different ways and schemes. So that was fun. Did you assassinate uh, him? I, I did not assassinate him. No, I did poison him so he would fall asleep so I could take the key off of him while we were in a little conversation group in the corner. <clears throat> but it was a sleep poison. I did not uh, try to kill him. No, there was there's no reason to try to kill him. Although my mentor who taught me how to be an assassin and then left me to die in my backstory, Dave, all of a sudden threw her into the mix <laughs> and said, I saw her across the ballroom and I spent probably about half an hour to 45 minutes of game time trying to find her. And I couldn't. So that was that was that was intriguing. A little bit of having your back little a little, you know, half handed. I mean, offhanded, tossed in sentence of backstory thrown back at you. And the story is always fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then I played Guild Ball versus Russ, Mm -hmm. which uh, we've already discussed. It was all about the time clock, really. I mean, had no one had scored by the time the clock had started to grind down for you, who we should say was learning a new team for the very first time and a very difficult team to learn. I was learning the hunters for the first time. So part of the challenge Uh, was, yeah, that's, that's not a fun way to learn on the clock with the hunters. And I was reading a lot of cards during the clock ticking. So that, that may have had it because we did end up, uh, but even once the clock penalty started kicking in and I started losing, you know, the point per, per turn, um, Craig was ahead of me substantially even before then, so I, it was kind of preordained, but it was, it was a lot of fun. I played my Masons for the first time, which is intriguing because they were my first team, mm-hmm. and everybody around here was t- starting to talk about playing the Masons, so I took up my uh, Morticians, which is uh, was the second team I ever painted, and I stuck with the Morticians and lost game after game after game after game after game, and this was the first win I think I've had in a while. And I liked it. <laughs> I liked the sensation. <laughs> I liked actually kicking at the goal and scoring. The ball going in. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The ball went in. And, and then it was, uh, I loved it. Be- well, it was, you know, it was a lot to do with the clock. But at the same time, I had a couple models right where they were supposed to be, tying up a bunch of guys. And Russ's goal kick sent it out um, near, my, near my captain who had just scored but also near his captain. And it was a very cool, dramatic guild ball moment when he tried to break away from brick yeah. to go get the ball and brick tripped him up. Yep. Yep. So that was fun. So then actually, um, uh, honor got in on the ball again and scored a second time because of that, the placement of all those pieces and, yeah, it was pretty back and the fact goals, that right. Russ was getting really rushed at that point. So that was good. It was, it was, an awesome it was game. a fun game, yeah. fun game. And then after that, I played our friend shifty will in Dead Zone 2, I uh, had a blast with that. Although, I, uh, if, if you follow us on Twitter, you've seen all the terrain. That's and awesome. uh, I spend probably about as much time building a de- Dead Zone board as I do playing Dead Zone. <laughs> and uh, I made this awesome multi-layer. There was places where it was four cubes high. It was this big multi-layer uh, board. 
And then all of the goal, uh, all of the uh, <clears throat> objectives uh, ended up landing on really high locations, <laughs> which is okay because that's cool. I was playing Plague, so I didn't have anybody who could fly, but and he was playing Enforcers with all jump packs. But, you know, that's okay. It's still cool. And then I looked at the board, and oh my god, if there wasn't a single route for me to get up to the top layers without going all the way over to his deployment zone. <laughs> it was insane. I had well walkways done. and gantries yes. and ramps, and, and they were all like all in these cool configurations. And it just happened to accidentally have a one cube gap all the way across right next to the center, uh, the center line of cubes. It was bizarre. Uh, I, I, I was looking at it. It was almost to the point where I was like, hey, do you mind if I change some? But I didn't. I didn't change <laughs> anything up. I was just like, let's just go and do it. And yeah, it was it was ended up being a close game. I hadn't played the plague in the new uh, edition yet. And um, so I had a bunch of guys who could shoot. And of course, they were all dying and they're not very good at shooting either. And then my combat guys got in and just started eating enforcers left and right. And I was like, oh, this is how you're supposed to play these guys. I get it now. <laughs> and. By the end of the game, he only had two enforcers left, but they were both high in the sky, parked on objectives I couldn't get to. I did have a mortar, so it was my first time with indirect fire with the new game, and I liked that too. So uh, we had a lot of new stuff come out, frag grenades, all kinds of cool stuff that I hadn't seen in my last game. Really enjoyed it. I should also mention that after last episode, I went back through the rule book as I was talking about the missions. There's There only being... Um, five or six of them uh, and they're not being tailored to specific factions and I uh, I found in a section of the book that I, I just couldn't remember at all reading that you can go in and kind of sh uh, change the missions so there's like a table for each mission where that mission itself can then be broken down into uh, secret missions so that you like, okay, we're going to do this, but now roll on that. And you each are going after something different, which is much more like the old dead zone. Uh, it's still not tailored to your individual, uh, faction, but it can be a cool way to play. And I kind of want to try that and going forward in the future. And I do think hopefully there's going to be a lot more of that in the future. Cause a lot of the local guys, uh, we've been playing at a new store lately and everybody seems to be able to get there on a fairly regular basis, which is a nice change of pace. And so uh, there's been a lot of talk about trying to get a very loosely organized uh, Dead Zone uh, campaign going. So that would be cool. Be awesome. And then yesterday to wrap it up, uh, one of my classes ha was wiped out by illness and field trips. And I didn't have enough students. I had less than half the students uh, that I normally have. And so we played a rousing uh, session of The Resistance because uh, of all the games, all the filler games I had, that's the one they chose. And so they played The Resistance four times. The uh, Spies won every time, hands down, easily, like the worst wipeouts I've seen ever in my entire <laughs> history of playing that game. And they still loved it, although they, I think they were starting to get frustrated. But, uh, but that was fun. That's always a fun game to bring out and very quick and easy to teach. And then it's a fast, fast game at like... 10 or 15 minutes of play. So that was fun. So that's me. Excellent. <clears throat> <laughs> uh, what about uh, modeling? JJ, you doing any uh, modeling, painting, assembly? Uh, a little bits and pieces. So like I said, I found, I found my, um, my Space Hulk set. So I, I've been putting all of that together. I like put that together in Australia, brought that back to, to London. So I'm getting getting around to painting those up and doing some stuff with that which has been quite fun. Because uh, it's the old, it's the, because it's the new one. It's the Snap Together Mm. Which oh right! Yeah. Surprisingly easy. It's yeah, like, this is modeling has never been so easy. What's no. going on? Especially for like, GW. Yeah, right. click, click, click. It's like, wow. Oh, all right, I can I can do this? Now, do you still um, like the detail? Do you still like how they look, even though they're snapped together? That yeah, yeah. The detail on them is amazing. Good. And they just yeah. they just snap in, and where the where the lines are is they sort of they they go into the the like shielding from the other piece. Mm -hmm. So it's not like two halves. It's actually you know under the terminators, the heads go in underneath the the sort of yeah. halo part of it. Oh, and so brilliant. it, it yeah. just, it all just fits together really nicely. Yeah. Oh yeah. They're, no they're, at at, they're entry level models. I mean, the, all of their plastics obviously are best in the industry, uh, but their entry level models are particularly amazing just because they're so easy to put together. But when they're together, they look amazing. That's yeah. great. There's, there's, there's really no option uh, short of master level um, uh, alterations to change the models. Mm-hmm. 
because of the way they fit all together. But when they fit together, they're seamless. They look awesome. They're dynamic poses. There's all kinds of cool little fiddly bits uh, and, you know, little little tabards and stuff. Yeah, I, I think they're great looking. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to be doing a bit of a paint session with my cousin to go through all of that. And he's got his set as well. So we're just going to sit down and bash out two two uh, Space Hulk sets together, which will be a lot of fun. Cool. Uh, and then because I'm still pretty undecided what team I'm going to be playing in season three of Guild Ball, I've been putting together all of the rest of the teams. Um, <laughs> well, that's so one way to do it. Sure. I've okay. <laughs> currently got I think I've got my fish masons, engineers. Uh, they're all fully painted, and I've almost finished painting my union team. Oh, uh, hey, my Matt, hunt- Matt painted a union team in about an hour and a half, didn't he say? I think yeah, so, but yeah. he's using an airbrush, and I that's don't true. do that. So that's true. me neither, me neither. Yeah, uh, so that's never going to happen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've just about finished my hunters. They're almost they're almost done, but my butchers are together. My morticians are being have started to be put together and what else have i got oh the alchemists uh they have well they're 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 still in bits but yeah then that's that's all of them so that'll be quite nice nice that's excellent cool yeah it'll get it'll get there i don't know when i'm gonna find time to paint them but that's that's fine (laughs) well you don't have to paint them until you decide on one that's the brilliant part of your plan you play test them all and then pick the team you like and then paint that one Oh, yeah, and yeah. then give all those people you're playtesting with a cheap, half-painted game? No, that's yeah. not JJ. That's you, Russ. That's you. <laughs> I would 100% oh, sorry. Sorry. It's early. cheap, it's early. half-painted it's early. game. Yeah. Like, no problems <laughs> as, at all. <laughs> as, as, as would we all. Right. Yeah. Um, well, great. That's I like I like your approach. Just just collect all of them and then later yeah. decide which one you like You're kind of taking a Pokemon approach to the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. you've got, you got, you, you got to catch them all. Like, that's got to happen. But the, yeah. the, the best part about that is then when, you know, if a friend turn, turns up and goes, oh, what's this Guild Ball thing you're constantly talking about, JJ? Right. We wish you'd shut up about it. Um, <laughs> play. it I've, I've got a team there yeah, and they yeah. can just bust it out Any and have team. a quick game. Any team they want. Yeah, uh, JJ, do you collect? Do you collect? Do you collect every model for each team, or do you just go with the basic? You know, a particular. How how do you decide which of the models you're going to have for each team? Then, or do you do you literally get them all? Uh, yeah, one of my friends when they turned up went, "Are you opening a store?" So I think that answers that question. <laughs> um, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, Craig. Yeah, how about so. you, sir? What do you what have you been modeling? Well, I've, I've, uh, I, I had that hiatus for a little bit in last episode, sure. and I'm trying to make up for that. So I'm uh, still working on my secret project. And in that secret project, I have finished sort of 20 infantry. And this is – I've kind of come to, a, I think, a new place in my, um, in my development as a painter and collector. I have a unit type in this project that I'm doing. And I found really awesome alternate models, so I got them, and they came in a box of 20. And in my, uh, in my mental build for this force in this secret project, I had two units of six put together, so I needed 12. And uh, so, But I painted up, I, I pri- put together and primed all 20, and I was starting to put in the details, and, and then I thought, you know what, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just do what I need, but I'm going to have the rest of them like up to a sort of basic standard and then <laughs> a new rule was released in an FAQ that totally changed the unit that I was working on and so I went back and revised my position and decided I was just going to finish 10 so I finished 10 to a really really nice level with a lot of like uh, details on the uh, uh, on the models and stuff like that can and I then guess? the other 10 are what's that can I guess yeah sure I, I would like to guess that it is the Russians for conflict 47 it is oh, okay. So, I was really hoping um, for that. <laughs> yeah, no, that was a good guess, though. I mean, were you cool. going to say no? Were you going to say no, no matter what, because you're trying to keep it a secret? Like, well, so yes, I could absolutely. guess anything, and then you're just going to say no, and it really wouldn't matter. Look, that's true. JJ, but that yeah, would be so, me lying, and this was me telling the truth. JJ, oh, should, right. you should guess also. Would you have a guess for what Craig's secret project is based on the models he's described? I you have could, absolutely. You could, no could also idea. ask one yes or no question. I. <laughs> Honestly, don't really know. No, okay. I've got I've got no clue what this could be. He's probably just getting back into 40k and doesn't want to tell you. Uh, that's probably <laughs> it. <laughs> that sounds uh, right. Okay, so and I finished four vehicles all the way through to weathering and decals, or I should say decals and weathering, because if you do it the other way, it looks really weird. 
Uh, and I'm, uh, I've got 45 in- infantry dry brushed and uh, the details going on and one final vehicle dry brushed and the details finally going on. So oh, wait, no, that's all Antares, Antares, uh, Algorians. Wrong! <sighs> okay. So, uh, and I'm working on the, ca- our terrain for the Captain Con game. Oh yes. Right. And I just finished last night, six buildings for it. So, Ooh. and of course that's a conflict 47 game. And we're going to do sort of like an English countryside terrain map. Uh, and so I found these awesome tabletop workshop models, tabletop workshop, to the best of my knowledge, in the way I've, uh, as much as I've been able to dig up online, uh, these guys who came up with this awesome way of making plastic, very easily put together uh, buildings. And they did a bunch of medieval ones and a medieval castle, and then apparently went out of business. And Warlord, I think bought the molds or bought their remaining stock or something and was selling out those. So I picked a bunch up at uh, Gordon's store, Adler Hobby, and then I got a few more of them from the um, Warlord website. And so I have, uh, I I think I'm up to eight buildings right now that are going to be like a little village of eight buildings and then some ruins. And then uh, I, I, I want to do some roads and some hedgerows and some trees and a, and a, uh, and an orchard that I, I got all the trees to do an orchard. So uh, I right now I'm just started when I just finished the six buildings. So that was fun. And that's been me. Russ, what about you? OK, well, let's see. I did finish my blazers, which are the mounted gun mage light. Tab. And they look beautiful on uh, Twitter. Very. Well, thank you. I was very excited to get those done. So I did a little airbrushing on the horses and then painted the riders uh, uh, with a traditional brush. Really like those. Uh, also, I've been working hard on my Trollblood's, uh, you know, war wagon, which is their uh, battle engine there. Um, and I got the oxen done now, so I just tweeted a picture of those. So they're attached now to the wagon, and now I just got to paint all the crew, which is uh, quite a few of those uh, in there. And then also, uh, Rose and I have been, uh, model- we, may- we paint together now, um, try to get in one day a week or so. And she just finished, I forget his name, but the tree dude we've been calling him. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a war a lock in the Circle of Oberos who his soul is actually two models. In the, there's a giant sort of a tree, which is where the actual warcaster's soul is. And then there's a body being carried around by sort of roots, uh, which is actually does all the movement and everything. And that's actually the warcaster's sort of totem but the his soul is in the tree she just finished him up and he was great Dude, that's a that's a that's a cool backstory it is a cool model it's, also yeah the name is cassius just. thank you thank you <laughs> jj <laughs> see i don't know these things i you know um less <laughs> less do you think jj is just a guild ball man right. <laughs> jj's over here going dear god just it's just cassius okay just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, he came out great she did a really good job on him also so can't wait to see him cool. across the table uh shortly as well so very nice that's that what about other stuff what about like geeky shows comics tv books what have you been uh, reading and watching there jj uh so well i got before i went to australia i was like i gotta do a solid like 30 hours on planes and airports oh. twice inside eight days so i went and got the new pokemon game because there's no way to kill time <laughs> like just throwing <laughs> pokeballs at little animals right um and also just challenging eight-year-old kids in airports <laughs> <It's> just <laughs> and trolling them really hard is just a lot of fun. Um, I'm a terrible human being. I'm aware of this, but that's that's okay. Uh, so I played a bit of that. Uh, my brother actually had it as well. So I rocked up in Perth, and my brother's flown over from Melbourne. And he and his he and his husband turn up, and they both have their Game Boys. And I was like, "You're not playing Pokemon." They're like, "Yeah, we are." I was like, "Oh, this is going to be a great great week now." <laughs> so that was that was a bit of a thing, which was a lot of fun. Um, Still didn't finish it because I just spent so much time grinding bloody children. Uh, so it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but I, fan- I managed to find – I've forgotten basically that I left a bunch of storage at my mum's place. Mm. Uh, so I found all my old like 40K art books and things like that. So I found oh, like my nice. collected visions books. and That's a big heavy horror- book. Oh, Yeah. Yeah, my bag was so over the weight limit when I came back. <laughs> so over the weight limit. Because um, oddly enough, right next to my Collected Visions book, all right, guess what was next to my Collected Visions book? Like, if you get this, I'll be thoroughly impressed, but I doubt it. Uh, the new Mark III Prime. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> I've been gone from Australia a long time, so no. <laughs> uh, Rogue Trader. 
No, that would have been really cool. Uh, but it was actually my old calculus book. So, you know, <laughs> I, 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 guess that. I, yeah, that, that was that was going to be my next guess. Though. Next guess. Right. So, yeah. so I'm actually reteaching myself calculus because I haven't had to do it for a number of years. Oh, nice. uh, but I feel like Why it's not? I should not have forgotten. Yes. Yeah, just just just, you know, it's a life skill. Remember, it is a life skill. I feel a bit bad that I've forgotten as much of it as I have. Uh, so now I've got this other book that weighs more than the Collected Visions book, but uh. it's just full of equations. And now you know why he's not going to get all those Guild Ball teams painted anytime That's soon. That's right. He's learning calculus. He's all doing over calculus again. in his spare time. <laughs> just in just... his free time. <laughs> right? Like, what else do you do with your free time? Exactly. Why know. paint models? Apparently. You can do calculus. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm reading philosophy equations. and relearning calculus. Right. That's that's my free time at the moment. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> um, but then Rogue One obviously was a thing. So uh-huh. I did see that a few times mm-hmm. um, because what did you think? I I love that film. Yeah, uh, me too. I thought it was a very very good entry into the sort of Star Wars world uh, without being a very very stereotypical Star Wars film where the Jedi's yeah. turn up and win everything. Right. Yeah. Um, I thought it was a really good story. And I think it was pretty well executed. Uh, I, I I heard, and I could be horribly wrong in this because this is like word of mouth from a friend of mine who's generally pretty, you know, savvy with such things. But I'm happy to be proven wrong here. That the that I'm not sure if it's the producer or the director. One of the two was removed by Disney, like right at the last minute, in like last four to five weeks of the editing, and they came through and Disney kind of Disney-fied the whole thing. Because apparently it was meant to be a lot – like the film quality was meant to be a lot more 70s B-grade gritty. Mm. Ah. But Disney wanted to make it more accessible, which is why there's a bit – it's got that sort of cleaner look in certain ah. aspects. Hmm. And I was like, well, I kind of want to see the gritty version because I, th- I feel <laughs> like that film – it, it follows very much that sort of. Um, uh, is it too? Is it too early for spoilers? Uh, we, uh, I might, might still be too early. Yeah, for spoilers. yeah, All right. Might, yeah. Might All right. Yeah, no, I, I didn't want to say it, but it, it follows. Yeah. yeah, okay. No, it's fine. I feel like that that gritty version probably would have fit the storyline a little bit better. Right. Perhaps. Yeah, yeah I, I would agree with that. I, I hopefully, on the, that. maybe yep. on the DVD they'll have or whatever they do uh, will be will have the both versions. That'd be kind of cool. It. Yeah, if they do that, that would be absolutely amazing. Yeah, that would be um, cool. Yeah, and then I'm I'm currently exercising extreme will, and I mean extreme will, from picking up Final Fantasy 15. Yeah, so my, I mean I know it was out the I back should, end of November. So um, if you're trying to learn but, calculus, I would say not. So so my my oldest daughter relearned received, calculus. So it, this time it should be quicker, right? Like theoretically. <laughs> so so my oldest daughter received uh, Final Fantasy for Christmas. She is a huge fan of uh, American style RPGs. So she loves Skyrim. She loves Dragon Age. She's never played a Japanese style RPG ever. Uh, right. And we, we pretty much lost her for a week. Uh, oh. And when she returned, she had solved the game. <laughs> so so <laughs> it, is, it is very engaging, very, very good. And they've managed to uh, make it appeal to uh, American RPG fans as well. I'm sure everybody who's pretty much a classic Final Fantasy fan will love it. But she really, really liked it a lot. Um, yeah. So I think it's everything that the critics are saying and more. And I have intentionally avoided it because I know I don't have the time to invest in that kind of a game. But uh, but she loved. <laughs> that's, it. She absolutely loved it. That's my extreme willpower. There is like yeah. I know that if I do that, I will just call in sick to work for a solid month. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. And lose my job. So yeah. that's probably not a great idea. Because <laughs> no. I did the same thing. Did the same thing with Fallout Four. I was like resisted mm-hmm. it, resisted it, and then eventually, <laughs> event, I say eventually, um, <laughs> like it was inevitable. But uh, I actually wound up getting pretty sick, so I was off work for a week and a half. Oh, there you uh, go. how convenient! And, that works out. And so I just so I went got went to the doctor. Was like, you can't go to work. You've got to stay at home. You've got to rest. Um, don't leave the house. Find <laughs> someone to bring you food and stock up your fridge because you're not going anywhere. Oh, if you like, say so, doc. Sure. All right. Fine. So my shopping list to to my mate that lived around the corner included Fallout Four. <laughs> right. Um, Return <laughs> with just, Fallout Four I just and sat food. Sat at home on the couch playing Fallout Four for a week and a half and yeah. getting better. I um, love it. I think I was probably better after a week, but I wasn't finished with the game. <laughs> so that's. You know, that's okay. So you took your full week and a half. I just love the idea. Yeah, of this, yeah. I, I love the idea of this text to your friend, you know, deathly ill, won't be seen for a week, send Fallout 4 and food. <laughs> yeah, know? right. Exactly that, more right. or less. <laughs> Very that's nice. Awesome. Excellent. Yeah. Russ, what about you? Well, uh, let's see. I am really enjoying The Pillars of Reality. And again, I have to thank Ross uh-huh. Watson for this. Uh, the first book of the series is Dragons of Doorcastle. This is by Jack Campbell. I am now in the second book. Uh, loving it. It's definitely targeted. It's definitely a, um, 
you know, teenage targeted book. Uh, but it's really, really well done. The universe is really interesting, compelling. I love how he evolves and slowly introduces the world, world building uh, as sort of a, a side thing. Um, the, the, it's just really a lot of fun. And my oldest daughter now, again, is 14, also uh, blasting through the books. She's already uh, pretty much done with the first one, moving on to the second one. She also is liking it a lot as well. So if you've got oh. uh, kids who are into fantasy or you yourself are into fantasy and don't mind sort of the, you know, Sort of Harry Potter level young adult style book. Uh, you'll you'll mm-hmm. enjoy it, I think. Um, and if 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 somebody would like to listen to the book instead of reading it and has been under a rock for the last six years, yes. how could they maybe get that book from Audible for free? Well, what you want to do is go to the d6generation dot com and click the Audible link in the upper right hand corner, and that will take you to Audible, uh, and that will also give you a free credit uh, thanks to our relationship with Audible. There, it also help support the show, so we'd appreciate it if you did it that way. And what that does then is you get a free credit, you get a free book. That book is yours to keep should you decide to never uh, continue your Audible relationship. You still get the book forever. Uh, so listen to it, enjoy it. They have pretty much every title you'd ever want to listen to. Uh, all the I, all the privateer press books are on there. You can listen to those. Uh, Eric Summer from the Dice Tower is a narrator over there. Many, many books are fantastic. So pretty much any book you want to hear or listen to, you hear something. Including somebody. apparently a dirty book. but Apparently. Know. But what I like about it is it gives me a chance to read, right? So if you're like JJ and trying to study calculus and you're really in front of that book all the time, but if you also have a long commute like I do, you can listen to those books in the car or while you're mowing the lawn or, or while you're painting models and still get some quality uh, book time whilst doing yep. other things. So definitely yeah, check absolutely. out Audible through the yep. D6Generation.com. Very cool. Also, I attempted... Now, I will say this. Uh-oh. We made it through the first hour and 10 minutes, so I did better uh-huh. than I did on other shows. But uh-huh. Emerald City, I could not get to the end of Emerald City. Do you guys try to watch okay. this show? No. All right. No. You didn't miss now, it. Now, that's a legitimate review. I couldn't get to the end of it. Now, yes. <laughs> be careful. <laughs> Moving on from that comment, though. Well, I just felt the story uh, wasn't compelling. Uh, I did mm-hmm. like the costumes. I liked the look of the universe. I uh, wasn't so sure about the ruby gloves compared to the that, that kind of really? faded away so that you didn't see them all the time because budget, I guess. I don't know. But, um, but yeah, Instead I don't know. Instead of ruby slippers? It, much is different, Craig. M- much is different. Ah. Uh, it's not a yellow okay. brick road. It's a yellow pollen road. Um, yellow pollen? Yes, yes. Uh, and, yes, so, uh, uh, the, the, um, the monkeys are clockwork, which is sort of interesting. Uh, and the, uh, the Wicked Witches are pretty cool, although one of them is an opium... And uh, opium dealer and uh, whorehouse administrator. Uh, so you know, it's it's a different kind of Wizard of Oz. It's, it's um, anyway. I don't I don't want to judge. So I'll just let you watch it if you would care to, okay. uh, and let me know if you get through more than I did. So you know. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, See, yeah. I thought you were going to say the story felt incomplete, and I was like, that's because you didn't finish watching it, Russ. Like <laughs> well, you know, it's... Well, the story. I know the end theoretically, although I'm not sure. Because, <laughs> well, uh, at know... this point in time, I'm not sure you could really guess what the end is. Oh, and you'll enjoy this. The 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 Munchkins are a cross between, I would say, a good cross between uh, Ewoks and Australian Aborigines is somewhere in there. <laughs> So, uh, right. you know, I, 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 and it's a good, as an Australian, of that, I, well, I don't know exactly. I don't say anything. I'm not allowed to touch that. I, I don't even not know what that to. means, but in any case, just, just watch the show. I don't, I don't really know what to tell you besides it's an interesting experience and, and, and one you mm. probably won't soon forget. Uh, moving on. Now I'm intrigued. <laughs> Don't don't be too excited, uh, really. No, uh, I, I, no, I I won't. But it, it is intriguing. Uh, yeah. So Vikings, uh, Vikings uh, in season oh, yeah. two. So another part of the tradition that Rose and I have started is we when we, whilst we paint, um, we watch Vikings and count the beheadings. This is sort of a thing we've done, <laughs> uh, and we are now in season two, and we are absolutely loving this show. And it's funny because. Nicole, my wife, and, and, and Kit tried to start watching it with us and couldn't get into it. They just like, oh, whatever. Rose and I are loving this thing. So we're like, cool. uh, we're about halfway through season two. Absolutely loving Vikings. Uh, looking forward to, to watching more of it. Um, nice. Saw Rogue One in 4D. Now, 4DX, I guess they call it. Craig, yes, did, you see, yeah. did you see it in 4DX also? I did. I recommended it to you first because my cousin talked about it. Yes. And then you went and did it like the next day. And I, I got all jealous. And I wanted to go do it too, uh, despite your review. Yeah, now what and I think? went and shared your uh, sentiments exactly. There's far too much being poked in the bottom, I think. Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> I think you might have accidentally <laughs> gone into a pre-screening of uh, Fifty Shades Darker, but I don't okay. know. <laughs> okay. There was lots uh, of poking. There wasn't that much poking in the bottom when right. I went and saw it, but okay. I was getting punched in the back incessantly. Yes. Lots of poking. Lots of punching. Lots of 
uh, ooh, the blaster was near you, so I'll blow your hair. Which, yep. for a male, is not a big deal, but for a woman uh, with longer uh-huh. hair, like my wife and daughter, your hair is constantly blowing in your face, so you can't actually watch the movie. Um, yeah. And I, I, as I mentioned to Craig when I, when I saw it, I enjoyed the space flight parts. So I didn't even like that. So, so, so to, for the listeners who aren't familiar with this whole 4DX thing, Luke, are you, uh, JJ, damn it. <laughs> JJ, are you familiar, oh, with, <laughs> JJ, are you familiar with the 4DX idea? I, what this is? I'm familiar with it as a concept, but I've never engaged in it. All right. So I didn't know this was a thing. So apparently, I mean, I've seen it at, at, at theme parks before, right? Like Disney's got a couple of these, Universal's a couple of these, but these are now apparently theaters sprinkled throughout the c- country. And you go into uh, these, around the world. Oh, world there's right. more around the world than there are in America. There's okay. only like five in America right now. They're really small. There happens to be a couple in New England, actually. But so, oh, really? Yeah, there's two in Massachusetts. <laughs> um, oh, I did not know. That. Yeah, I went to the one down by IKEA, actually, of all places. Oh. Uh, so, so, but in any case, um, so what you do is you go in, you sit down in these, in these sort of funky chairs, and the chairs move. Uh, there is wind that can blow in your face. There's lights that can flash. There's scents they can inject into the room. There are. Not only can the chairs move, uh, but also there's things in the chairs that can push your various parts of your body. Um, and the idea is that they map these then to events in the movie, and it's more immersive, right? And so when you're, in, when you're in space and the ships are sort of banking and flying and the chairs sort of bank and fly, for me, that worked. And it was kind of like Star Tours a little bit um, yeah. in Disney World, which I, which I enjoyed. But on the ground, there were parts in the movie that I really felt weird. Like there's a part in the beginning of Rogue One, there's the girl, little girl running, and they felt yeah. the need to make the chairs you know, sort of vibrate with each step of the little girl, and you're sort of like, she's not a mech. Like, why? Like, right. <laughs> like, she's a little girl. Maybe she is. <laughs> right. yeah. Or anytime somebody's on a, on a ladder. Yes. Yeah. Your, your seat's like, to the left, to the right, to the left, to the right, yeah. to, the, to the beat of someone going down a ladder. Right. And, and to the, the beat part, of an ATST walking past yeah, you. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and the weirdest part is that the perspective of getting poked is, and punched and moved is constantly shifting. So, mm. like, one minute, you know, the main character will shoot someone in the back, and you'll get shot, you'll get poked in the back, like, you get shot in the back. That's kind of cool. But the next minute, someone, he gets punched or, or moved or whatever, and you get shaken from his point of view. So it's almost like you're constantly experiencing what every character in the movie is experiencing. Yeah, and it's a little that disconcerting. Was it's like, yeah. it's that, like, who that am I supposed to That doesn't seem right. Yeah. No. So, so it might be I feel like it would be a really good VR thing if you're navigating a world, right? Because yes. then you would experience what you're experiencing. That sounds cool, but to experience everything? Yeah. No. yeah. I feel like it's it's like the early days of 3D where they needed to kind of wow you cons- constantly, and now they've kind of yeah. figured out that maybe you don't need to poke a stick in someone's face to have them experience 3D. I kind of feel like yeah. they're overdoing it right now because they're, they just want to really show it off, and I kind of feel yeah. like if you kind of toned it back, less might be more in this thing. I, I, you know, I, I kind of feel I, like something... I found that, it very distracting from the... And, and yes. the seat's not comfortable. No, like no. I mean, in a in a world in a in a world, in a world. where anybody, uh, like where you're paying a premium ticket price to sit in a giant lounge chair where the you know where the footrest comes up automatically and everything, to pay double that price mm-hmm. to go perched on a on a high chair for all intents and purposes, yeah, with like in a very uncomfortable chair and then get constantly harassed. And shaken and, and punched in the punching in the back thing to the at the end. I was just like, please no. And I knew all along. I mean, every time any character on stage gets any kind of impact in the back, whether they're getting blasted by a blaster or thrown to the ground or pushed against a wall, you're getting punched in the back. Right. And I thought as I was as I was watching it, the war scenes the, are going to be this tough. Is the third, what's that? <laughs> the war scenes are going to be tough. <laughs> exactly. Well, as, as I was watching it, I'm think I've already seen the movie twice. I'm like, oh my god, this, the 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 space battle is going to be horrific because everybody knows whenever a rebel fighter whenever a rebel pilot dies his ship explodes from behind (laughs) and that's what happened every time a rebel pilot died you got punched in the back like punched in the kidney it was insane and so i just yeah i was very disillusioned by the whole thing uh, my son thought it was a, a, a blast because he kept getting punched in the back of the head because he's, you know, <laughs> shorter. And, so he's like, <laughs> and at, one, at one point, he leaned over and was like, Daddy, you didn't tell me the chair was going to punch me. Right. Like, Sorry, buddy. So uh, last thing I wanted to cover real quick uh, is um, I was excited to find out yesterday that our panel for PAX East, our panel, I was invited to participate in a panel uh on, from PAX East, and it was just—I just found out it was just approved, and I can't believe I was invited to be on this panel because, quite frankly, yeah, this is a crazy. Panel. Everybody else in the panel is much more interesting than I am, but uh, it's the panel is titled uh, "The Art of Choosing Which Board Game to Play." 
Like, apparently, mm. I know what to say about this. But uh, I'm going to be on this. Uh, Tom Vassell will be on it, of course, from the Dice Tower. I'm on it. Uh, Chris Kirkman from State of the Game is going to be on there. Matt Morgan is going to be on there. He's the one that set it up, so thank you, Matt, for all that. Um, uh, Nate Anderson from Ars Technica is going to be on there. And, of course, Eric Martin from Board Game Geek. So quite a panel. I can't even believe I'm in the same room with these no. guys. So really you can tell looking at the title, though, that you had nothing to do with choosing the title. That's, that's right. There's, yes. there's the art of choosing which board right. game to play. First of all, there's not even any alliteration. No, none. What's and so, and yes, and, right. and there's just no there's the, it's like <laughs> other than the cho- cho- using the word art, it literally is just telling you what it's going to do. Right. We will yeah, help you, need, you choose a board game. <laughs> yeah, there's a flowchart for that, so you need to come up with a snappier title, right? I, I, yeah, well, yeah, I we'll, we'll figure something out. But I'm looking forward yeah. to it, so I'm excited that we but got. No, it looks like it'll be awesome, Ross. And you need to take advantage of that opportunity to get some more uh, third chairs out yeah. of this Ooh, crowd. Good idea. Oh, I'll definitely do that. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, they're all Just, infinitely more interesting than I am. No, well, no, no, no. I was no, gonna no. say, hopefully <laughs> none of them are Australian, because then we won't have a chance. Because they'll be like, "Hey, mate." How are you, JJ? Oh, I mean Luke. Oh, I mean what's your name again? It'll be awkward. It'll be random awkward. other Australian we know. But that's <laughs> right, fine. random right. Australian. Oh, I should just change it to that. All right, Craig. Craig, <laughs> what have you been? What have you been doing, sir? In the ah, uh, well, let's see. I'm listening to Who Killed Sherlock Holmes from the Shadow Police series that I've been listening to by Paul Cornell. And a quick thanks to Paul Owen, the listener who uh, recommended them to me. I'm really, really loving them. I'm engaged. Uh, it's doing this intriguing thing with the story arcs within story arcs. Uh, I love the world that's being built. Um, uh, the whole using meth to stay awake thing in the second book was, is still kind of in the back of my head and would like, so you have characters in this book that are putting themselves through emotional stress. That's having far more of an effect than constant use of meth to stay awake was in the last book. So there's a little weird disconnect there on that one. And I wish he had gone with some other, uh, plot device to keep them awake in the second book, Severed Streets. But other than that, I'm absolutely loving it. Uh, I believe Vikings is on season four now. I think so, it? yes, because my youngest daughter yeah. accidentally started watching that one. <laughs> yeah, and um, I'm going to say uh, season two was cool and then started to grind a little bit, and season three grinded a lot more for me, and season four is really amazing and it's totally brought it back around and it's making hard choices and it's showing you really awesome stuff. Um, very, very surprising turns and twists. And it's super intriguing to me that any show that's only been on for four years will have, would have aged its primary focus character, um, Ragnar Lothbrook. Um, spoilers, dude, so, spoilers. I, know, he's, I have that? not gotten there. I'm only season two. Well, now we know we're just saying that he's like he's he's he matures like physically matures over the course of the thing. You don't right. usually see that. That's all, all I'm right. saying. OK. And uh, it's like <laughs> and it's it's intriguing because, you don't the whole it, it's following an actual story of a of a quote unquote real character in history. Yes. Uh, that's so far back in time that we, people don't know exactly what's real and what's myth, which is cool because they weave all that together amazingly well in the series. And the act, the, the, the strength of the, the story, whether it's a myth or reality, comes from his sons. So you have to have m- mature sons in the storyline. So it, it, right. it, do, it jumps forward from time to time so that the sons are getting older and they do a really cool job of Ragnar Lothbrook getting older at the same time. So it's right. just very, very cool, awesome season. Well, quick aside uh, loved about, it. Quick aside about the Vikings, too. So my oldest, my, my daughter Rose, she's a freshman in high school now. So her... Uh, history teacher really likes Vikings, uh, primarily yeah. because it is so historically accurate. Like many things about the show are very, very accurate. How they fight, their equipment, their costumes, the, the whole thing is very, very good. good. And it's an interesting, she keeps telling me, like, he kind of secretly talks to me about it because the content of the show is very adult. <laughs> so he can't really recommend yes. the class watch Vikings, but he, he knows she watches <laughs> and he's like, oh, did you see? This part's really cool because remember we talked about this in, in class and it's kind of, and she, so she's really enjoying it because <laughs> she kind of feels like she's getting, you know, extra history lessons along with the fun of watching beheadings. So yeah, uh, it's a double win. Very really. nice. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Win, win. <laughs> right. Uh, I went and saw the movie passengers and well, it is getting that? tanked by, it uh, is. by the critics. Yeah. Um, but I loved it. Did you? I'm not. Sh- yeah, I loved it. Did you see it? No, but Nicole really wants to see it. And we've been kind of like on the edge because of the- maybe we'll go see it this weekend. It's, it's, yeah. it, it's very sentimental. 
and not sentimental like you know oh the good old days sentimental meaning it it focuses on feelings yep which is usually gets you a crappy review from uh from the the critics if it's a sci-fi you know right. god forbid sure. sci-fi fantasy or or any fan you know fantastical fiction mm -hmm. tries to get emotionally in. and there's a lot of weird like um the, the 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 charges made by a lot of the critics are very strange to me and seem to be coming from an ideological standpoint that I don't share. Ah. So I'm like, I didn't see that. I thought I, I saw a really cool story and yeah, this guy does something weird and, and she reacts weird to it. But I like, they're all caught up in this amazingly strange emotional situation that you can't possibly imagine how anybody would interact or how they would react. And I, I just loved. It. On the other hand, I'm a huge Chris Pratt fan, right? And I really like Jennifer Lawrence as well. So uh, the special effects are amazing. Um, I I would love for you to go, Russ, because I want to know. Like the physics didn't bother me. There were a couple of moments where I was like, "Hey, wait!" And then I was like, "Oh no, that could probably." So it would be interesting, like if there's something in there that would just shut you off completely, or or if it's all like I all right, cool. uh, when I saw gravity, I hated gravity because it was so obviously wrong and I'm an idiot and I failed physics and I still knew it was wrong. <laughs> um, this movie didn't have any of that. But I'll tell you, the ship, the spaceship is awesome. Cool. It's really, really cool. So, yeah, I would recommend it. Um, I mean, keep in mind that the critics hated it, but uh, right. I think it's at like 65 percent for uh, viewers on Rotten Tomatoes. And I, I, I got a, I left it totally satisfied and really really enjoyed it all right well, maybe i'll take nicole this weekend we were looking for a fun sort of semi-romantic movie so that's good oh, well this is fun and semi-romantic perfect perfect all right well is that achievements that is achievements excellent in a world where board gaming was king in a time when kickstarter ruled the web when every day brought more and more games. Now, more than ever, two men, and a revolving third chair, and a girl, a total fangirl, brought a shining light into the darkness so that all mankind would know what to buy. They are the D6 generation. Hey, and now it's time to talk about our friends at Battlefoam.com. Uh, you know, Battlefoam. I love my Battlefoam. I, you know, I'm just, Craig, I'm getting all into the Hunters, you know, for the Guild Ball. Yes. And, yep, yep. Uh, you know, I'm really enjoying it. I'm, I'm loving them. And they have, Guild Ball models are so fine, little, you know, bendable parts. They're just so beautiful. And I want to make sure I can keep them safe when I travel. And, of course, with something like this, we have a small model count. You still got to carry these things yep. around. You still got to get them where you want to go. And I just... It's not even a thought process for me. I absolutely am certain if I get battle foam, put it in a battle foam bag, it's going to get where I want to go and get there perfectly safe every time. Yep. Now, have you seen the new um, X-Pack? No. Tell me about the X-Pack, Craig. Well, have you noticed that board games, uh, more and more often they're coming in that new square box format? Yes, yes, yeah. Well, the X pack is their new, is Battle Foam's new bag. It's a giant backpack carrying uh apparatus for board games wow that's awesome i have to check that in, out in their in their boxes rafe always wanted awesome. that rafe has always been asking for one of those yeah, he I'm has sure he, he has about that. it's two separate bags one has a backpack straps with padding on the back for comfort oh, the nice. other uses a shoulder strap to carry around oh, so yeah. you've got two bags in one on that one and they and they come together as one big uh, package if you want to carry two games. That is awesome. Looks, i got to check that out. It looks pretty Greg, cool. Greg, I'm over here on Battle Foam right now, and I just realized the Conan foam trays are out. So I have the big Conan board uh -huh. game from Kickstarter. It's got a million models in it. I was just thinking about how to travel, and here they are, all the foam for Conan, and it fits back in the box. What? Yeah. Oh, man, i got to go pick that up, too. So if you need yeah, any of this stuff. I'm telling you, they, the thing about Battle Foam is they are always adapting, always yeah. coming up with new stuff. And don't forget, too, they got very affordable options as well. If you want to go with their Battle Foam boxes, 
which yep. hold all that great, super great foam, but in a variable, affordable way. You know, maybe you only afford one. You can only afford one really fancy battle foam bag, but you need a place to store all your foam for your other armies and just switch them out. No problem. Use the boxes to keep things all organized and get things back and forth yeah. as well. Yeah, very simple. Very great. Yep. They're crazy. Just remember, it's Good not stuff. about miniature games anymore. Just about miniature games. You can also get great board game stuff options at Battle Foam as well, because so many board games now have fantastic models and they really don't fit back in the box. And that's where Battle Foam comes in. Yeah, yeah. Well, Battle Foam's got everything covered with there because they've got Battle Foam for, to go inside your boxes mm-hmm. for those models that have a lot of, uh, I mean, for those games that have a lot of models. And now they have this new, uh, this new pack for your other board games that have their own good interior uh, box control. Exactly Crazy. Right. They're always thinking over there. They are. So head on over to Battlefoam.com. Whoa! And now, in an attempt to bring a small amount of dignity and decorum to this otherwise base form of entertainment, and I use the term loosely, I am proud to present... Oh, get on with it. It's time for App of the Up. Seriously, Wakeland, I used to have my own segment, and now I'm relegating to announcing this pap... Hey, you're lucky we still use you. Hello and welcome to another app of the app. This time around, I want to talk about Whiteout. Uh, this is the latest in a line of games, actually from Lifeline and a couple of these different games. This is a really interesting game. My daughter's actually found this for me and turned me on to it. Uh, it is available on iOS and Android. And what's really pretty cool about this game is it is totally a text adventure, uh, reminiscent of the old Infocom uh, Zork type games. Uh, but the premise of this particular one is that. Um, a person has uh, had some sort of accident uh, in the Antarctic in this particular one or someplace. We don't actually know exactly where he or she is, or he is, I guess. And you get are getting texts from this person. Uh, and then you simply read the text. It's not it's in an app. It's not real text. But you, reading the text from this individual, he's telling you what he's discovering, where he is. And then you get to pick uh, a, sort of two different responses each time and see what happens to him. A very, very simple gameplay, but a incredibly good storytelling, very engaging. And what's interesting about the game is um, at certain points, he'll go back and say, okay, I'm going to go check this out. Do you think I should climb the cliff or try to stay here and weather the storm? Uh, You choose what for him to do, and he'll say, okay, I'll I'll try that. I'll let you know when the storm passes, and then you wait. And you wait in real time, and then he'll text you later. You'll get a notification on your phone that he's got more information for you. Very simple little engaging game, but the story, again, is really, really compelling, and it's nice to see that old storytelling style of just a text adventure is still alive and well and doing quite well on mobile apps, which is great, great, great fun. Also, I just got sucked back into, normally I try to avoid these uh, free-to-play games uh, where you pay a little bit to do more, but I have to say, Star Trek Timeline sucked me back in. This is a very simple game. Um, uh, it takes pl- the, the premise of the game is in the Star Trek universe, but there's some kind of strange time continuum, so there's everything's mashed up, right? So there's people from the original series along with Next Gen and Deep Space Nine and Voyager are all mixed together, uh, and... Uh, what's interesting about it is you build your ship, you have your crew, you can change your starships, and you go on these little missions, and you try to choose which crew members you're going to send on an away mission to make sure you have the right set of skills to succeed. And there's also these really simple space battles. The graphics are pretty fun, but there's not really a lot of, you're just sort of picking actions to do. Uh, You're not really worried too much about actual maneuver or anything. But it's a nice little fun game. Um, It does, it's one of those games you play a little bit, then you wait, then you play a little bit, and you wait, and if you really get impatient, you spend money to buy coins, so it's it's one of those kinds of games. I d- generally don't like those, but it's really well done. The sound effects are great. The lines are good, and it does give that little flavor of Star Trek as well. So Star Trek Timelines is pretty fun, but I would really, really highly m- recommend Lifeline Whiteout. And that's it for this App of the App. Thank you for listening to another scintillating edition of App of the App. A segment in which, hey, what's all that? More just getting on with the show. Seriously, Wakelin, you are like school in summer. No class. Hey, welcome back. And since we have JJ on the show, and things, you know, guys, things, they are a-changing. Have you noticed this? Uh, You know, new technology, new world leadership, all kinds of crazy things happening, new year. and That's that's Russ being all folksy. Let me uh, let me <laughs> let me translate that. 
things are changing. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I was about to say, I wouldn't lump Trump in with technology changes in miniatures, but yeah, sure, let's go with okay, that. Okay, fine. Yes, fair enough. Uh, but in any case, um, so I thought it'd be great since JJ's here and, and we'd talk a little bit about some of the changes that we've been seeing in the miniature gaming industry in particular uh, that have been influenced by technology. I think we're seeing a lot of different ways that um, miniature gaming delivery has evolved, both mm. the, the physical bits, the models, as well as how the rules get delivered, too. I thought it'd be kind of fun to go through that. But first, before we get all that, Craig, we have a traditional question we should probably ask JJ at this point in the show. Do you know what we should probably ask him? Uh, what is your favorite color? Green. Excellent. You now we proceed, good. right? That's yeah, easy. Now we may move on. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> JJ, are you now or have you ever been a gamer? Uh, the short answer to that is yes, but right, I don't think that's probably. Now we, probably, now oh, we can wait, move on. No, right? there's a history. <laughs> Of course, there's a history. Now, I started uh, miniature gaming when I was nine, actually, wow. a long, long time ago now. So been doing that ever since. Used to work for Games Workshop back in the day, the, oh. the evil empire that is. Yes, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> Haven't um, we all? <laughs> I think just about everyone at some point yeah. has, has set foot in there. Uh, but I, well, I guess people that listen to your show may know that I used to do World's End Radio many, many years well. ago now. May well. Uh, so that's, yeah, so that was me. Uh, but my focus has been largely on competitive wargaming since then. So I've been playing competitively across a range of systems um, from Magic to Dominion to Settlers of Catan to War Machine and Hordes, now now Guild Ball, uh, used to be 40k Fantasy, all that sort of stuff as well. So yeah, I'm, I've been pretty invested in this for a little while. Mm. Right and to- mainly on the like competitive side. Um, competitive side, I used to do a bunch of painting as well. So I had a couple of, um, models go through to golden demon finals and semifinals and things like that. Uh, so I did, did a bunch of that. Don't do too much painting anymore. It's a bit, bit time consuming. Uh, but yeah, no, so I've made, but mainly on the competitive side. Right. Excellent. Well, back in the day with GW painting was all a part of that, right? Yeah, yeah. It's actually interesting. I was back in, back in Perth for, for Christmas to see my family and, uh, (laughs) I've, went through my box my mum got very angry and was like you need to take all your stuff back to england it can't stay here anymore i was like it's 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 one very small box in your 12 car garage like what what, what's the problem (laughs) um but i found my old um well it's my award for winning the best painted and best presented army at a grand tournament in australia i was like wow i forgot even had that that's so yeah it was a huge part of it that goes right up on the wall in the living room that's what i think straight back and went up and everyone's coming and going you paint your own models? I was like, yeah, yeah. They're like, oh, we thought you didn't because they look good. I was like, thanks, guys. Thanks. thanks. <laughs> nice. Um, well, JJ, when you started um, back when you were nine <laughs> or, mm-hmm. or a little later, um, do you remember there being – did, did miniature gaming in any way feel like it was connected to technology or back then was it pretty much not in any way connected? Did you remember any technology? Was it analog? Yeah, was it pretty much completely <laughs> analog? Yeah, 100% analog. I mean, I actually remember because things like import taxes in Australia are insane, or at least they used to be for for games and all the rest of it. So I remember when I was little and trying to get into playing the games, the the models in Australia were so heinously expensive um, that I used to actually do the the mail order from the back catalog in the White Dwarves with all the part numbers and Mm -hmm. then mail that over to the Games Workshop in the UK and have it paid (laughs) and shipped over to me. Um, I can't even imagine doing that now, actually. Wow, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that... yeah, but old old catalog numbers and uh, snail mail for ordering models was was how it used to be done, I guess. Yes. So, wow. yeah, so back in the day, right, in Australia, it was extremely expensive. Is it still that expensive to get models down there, or they've kind of, have they resolved that issue now? Uh, to, to some extent, the internet's resolved most of it, because mm-hmm. uh, you, you just order anything online from wherever. But right. it's, I think it's that, that, you know, the biggest problem with a lot of the miniature gaming stuff for a brick and mortar store is that they've got such high overheads in a, in a city or in a major area that they end up having to put a markup on, on product that you can't compete with on a just in time management system for online sales. Right. And that's, that's just as true in Australia as, as it is anywhere else. And of course, shipping to the end of the world. Yeah. See, that's one thing that I think has has probably changed a bit Oh yeah. There's not I mean that there are now, you know, Games Workshop now has local warehouses and things in Australia as opposed to you know, no no local production of course, but it's it's 
they've got their own warehouses, so they're not paying a premium for storage and all those sorts of things. So that has come down. But when you compare Australian prices on general retail to overseas, it's not even it's not even comparable. Yeah, but it sounds like at least the distribution has gotten better, probably worldwide, certainly in Australia, but in other places too. And and the um, the internet, of course, evolved over the past you know fifteen, sixteen years in particular uh, of getting information out, which is which is great. Um, let's talk a little bit about how it has changed how we play the games, and I think one of the places that it really shifted. Um, because I don't know about you, JJ, but when I first started playing, I mean, the internet was always a part, a little bit of what we did. I mean, we always shared our images and models on the internet, but I don't know that, like, um, net lists and stuff were as big a deal back in the day as they are today. Is that fair? Is it is it more people go right to the internet now when they're building their first list? Did, did that always happen, or do you feel like that's become a thing, too? I think that's definitely become a thing. I mean, I guess it varies from game to game and i think um you know having a background in something like magic the gathering where net lists are just rampant uh you don't even go and buy any cards until you've checked out what's what's winning and where whereas i think it was definitely a development in miniature wargaming um but i'm not a big fan of net lists in miniature wargaming i don't think they hold the same strength as that they do in something like a card game yeah i think, I think there's probably. so much down to that the, the general's ability to see things on the board that's so much looser that you can have the net list that's won world championships times and times again and put it in the hands of the wrong person. You're never going to get anywhere with it. Right. I think it's fair. I think it's one of the things I like about miniature games and something I've, I've as an aside, mentioned about card games a lot is that um, in many card games, the game is won and lost when you build your list. But in miniature gaming, while the list can give you a huge edge, there's still plenty of things to do on the tabletop to, to mitigate those, those challenges, yeah. which is great. Exactly. Um, but I think what happened initially with a lot of gaming companies is that when the inter- when some of this technology came out, they were sort of resistant to it, right? I think now what's happening is they're starting to embrace it. And I think they're really starting to embrace it a couple things. They're embracing that they get a lot of the information back from the community more, right? So a lot of these companies now, they know what their, uh, what their community is playing. They know how their armies are functioning and they see immediately the kind of decisions they're making, which ones are doing well and which ones are, are not doing well. And one of the things the internet has let them do is initially they kind of, they didn't leverage the internet. I don't think in the optimum way, and we'll talk about what, what that might be in a minute, but what they did do at least was pre- print new updated FAQs pretty regularly on the internet. So they'd hear there was a problem and they'd put it, uh, an FAQ out there. That introduces its own problems into the games, but that's sort of how they started, right, leveraging the internet. It was like, well, we have this sort of one-way communication system, sort of a, a publishing tool that gets it out to the community instantly, and we have these forums, which gives us feedback back, and so we'll just listen to the forums and publish FAQs, and that should solve everything. And that was sort of like the, the 1.0 version of how they use the internet. Is that, is that a fair statement? What, what, what did you notice during that time period, JJ? Um, it's, I mean, I've always found internet forums and a company's ability to engage in them in a meaningful way to be a really big stumbling block for miniature games. It's something I think that a lot of companies still really struggle with. So I think you're, I think you're right. I mean, they did all of a sudden have this feedback loop that they had, they, they never had access to before. It was all internal play tests and whatever the developers felt like doing, but, I feel like sometimes with the FAQs, when they were released, they were a little bit rushed and a, a little bit under-researched. So I remember some of the original GW FAQs when they had the, you know, mm-hmm. had to suddenly patch up text boxes and bits of war gear and things like that in a 40K rule book and things. And they were said, you know, cut this out and paste it over the top of your book. And you're going, I'm not, I'm not doing that. That's ridiculous. But, the, but a lot of that I feel like was very snap decision. There was no playtesting behind it. It was a bunch of very vocal people on a forum, which you, you tend to get, uh, who just keep yelling until something changes. Yes. I think it's exactly and, right. I, th- I, think, I think the problem was that, and what everybody didn't realize in the beginning, or maybe they did but just didn't think about it enough, was that you're exactly right. The forums don't always represent everybody in the community. They generally represent a smaller subset of the community, right? And um, you're you're really uh, it needs more than that. It's all anecdotal evidence, right? It's it's your new my new list came out and it's different, so it's broken. And it's not it's not really data, right? It's just opinion. Um, exactly. And I think what's changing now, I think the the next level that occurred 
is that these companies now have access to really meaningful data. So as tournament systems and casual but loggable play occurred, you know what I mean? Like, you know, the online events where you can go participate and your every game counts and you, you know, there's some kind of meaningful change to the story or whatever. Other ways to engage with the company with data that aren't just forums, right? So I can record my battles online. I can record my battles in some kind of, you know, a phone application. Um, I can play in a tournament and all those battles results go back to the manufacturer somehow. Now the manufacturer has a lot of this information. They have actual hard data. They see which miniatures are getting used of the collection, which aren't getting fielded, which ones are involved in wins, which ones are involved in losses. And they can actually analyze and say, you know what, some of these complaints about this are valid. We're seeing no one's playing this model or we're seeing that the model loses consistently. And they can make more informed decisions about that. Is that sort of, uh, is that fair? Is that what's starting to happen now, we think? Um, I think to to an extent, but there's, I, I think that a lot of the the issue with some of the tournament trackers and things like that is they're all run by independent people. Mm. Uh, so again, it depends on whether or not the company chooses to engage with those stats, and then it comes down to individual tournament organizers taking all the information you're talking about and feeding it back. I think the advent of live streaming for when you, I mean, we were all at SteamCon and we had the we had the live streaming of right. the, the the world the world championships there. So clear, and it was commentated on and done by by Steamforge Games. So so they've got access to all of that information and they can watch very high level players doing what they do best, which is great. Um, but it's whether or not they actually take that and do anything with it. It's I, I find that it's sometimes you get models in games which are not overly used, but actually ha- have a huge impact on the game. Right. And they they didn't they tend to slip under the radar for a lot of people. And maybe it's a very small niche that are using it, but the model itself is actually inherently broken in a number of scenarios. But the vast majority of the community aren't aware of it. That to me that that, that does exist in a, in a few games uh, and, and a few little rules sections as well. And there's no real way to get that feedback from a win loss record. Right. Uh, so that's that's one thing that I think is a bit of a bit of a well it it could it could go exactly as you're saying but it can also probably get glossed over. I think probably more importantly uh, is that a lot of companies now are moving towards this very much long lead playtest style yes. uh, and and what the internet has allowed them to do is engage with a number of playtest groups and a number of different metagames and styles of gamers that are are well known by advent of podcasts, vidcasts, match reports, tournament reports, all these sorts of things, and give them the opportunity to go on to have playtest groups and not just give... Not just give anecdotal evidence, but record their games, give play-by-play analysis of what they liked, what they didn't like, what what felt good, what felt bad, and how all those things interacted. And I think the companies that are doing well at the moment, that's exactly what they're doing, is they're engaging with the, especially if they're trying to build a competitive game and a competitive scene, they're engaging with those individuals and those play groups mm-hmm. very early on in the rules development uh, of new release models and how they interact with the existing rule set and existing models and taking that feedback on. Yeah. I think that's awesome. And that's, I think you, you went to the next logical place, which is, I think it's really interesting uh, because now you're starting to see a model that is very similar to something I know well in my other life, which is software development. So what it sounds like they're doing is they are building a little beta test groups, right? Of, of really skilled users that are different use cases, right? Different kinds of users, different kinds of user personas, we call them in software, um, and getting those little test groups together and then being able to um, release into those groups, get understanding back, and then inform the final product based on their feedback, which I think is awesome. Um, And that's really where software has gone and other products have gone, and it's not a surprise really to see that miniature gaming, uh, gaming in general does this. I know a lot of game, you know, board games do this too now, uh, but mm-hmm. miniature gaming in particular, because there are so many variables, so many factions, so many rules, you know, nuances that can occur based on people's terrain and their board and their play groups and their play styles, that it's really cool to have that capability. And I think you're right. I think it's a culmination of how the internet has evolved as a communication medium, and there's all these quote unquote air quote experts out there with podcasts and blogs and everything that people have come to respect and understand and know Bunch the analysis. Of jerks. Right. <laughs> um, and then they're and they're willing to spend their time helping the companies out for for little or no compensation, which is which is great. Um, so but then the next problem we get to is so it sounds like we've got we're getting to the point where these companies are figuring out 
how to get the feedback back and figuring out um, some of the companies. Some of them are. Yes. Yeah, but some. but then the question is, okay, so how do you leverage technology to deliver the changes? Because in software, we have a huge advantage, right? So if we go out and we release a new product and we beta test it still and release it and then something's different or needs to change, well, it's no problem. We change the code, we push a patch, boom, the software is fixed. Within days, there's nothing to do. But since miniature gaming, so much of it is physical, how do you solve that problem? Do you, how do you handle that? And, and I think there's two companies in particular, but others are playing around as well, that have, that have adopted very um, similar to the software lifecycle approach. Uh, one of them we talked to Steamforge about quite a bit, and Steamforge has gone to the regular release model. So they've gone to the annual, they're calling it seasons, right? So they've essentially gone to an annual release approach. And they're saying every year, like clockwork, at our event, there will be a new season, and a new season will mean a new set of rules for all models, um, updated basic rules. Uh, all the cards may and probably will change, um, and that's the plan. And we will absorb your feedback throughout the year. We'll play test throughout the year, and then these changes will come out again, and you will just know when to expect them. And that means there will be new books, there will be new cards, and there will be new excitement. Is that is that fair to characterize how Steam Forge is tackling it, JJ? I, yeah, yeah, no, I think that's 100% right because, and I think Steamforge is doing a really great thing there because if you look at the release schedule, I mean, for season three, uh, they've mm-hmm. got two new teams coming out this season. So you know that when they come out, all of the existing guilds have been replay tested and re benchmarked against those new teams. Mm-hmm. So they're not coming in and you don't have that old idea of power creep is when something new comes out, it's more powerful. And right. then you wait for a new release cycle to make everything else more powerful. And then it just cascades exponentially and all gets very terrible very quickly. The the season three, the, the, you know, the redo of season three with all of the updates to the cards was based on two years of play testing on top of what was done before season one. And against the new release rules and the new the new guilds that were coming out, which was a really really great thing to see. So when you start looking at oh, I mean we know we don't know what the rules for you know the farmers that are coming out um, that that they've announced, but that you can you can basically guarantee that the play testing's already been done to make sure all the changes take that new guild into account. Right. Which is which is just brilliant because it means when they come out, they're not going to be underpowered, they're not going to be overpowered. It's all going to be it's all just going to feel like it fits. Right, and your rule set is never more than a years old, right? So you can when you have these new ideas, like some let's say some new crazy cool concept in farmers comes up, and they're like, oh, we really want to put this in here, but it doesn't fit into the rules we have today. Well, don't worry, season you know season four comes out six months later than them, so why don't we just save that for that, right? And they can. You know, they don't have to worry about, or, or the rule set is five years old, and so there's some stuff that's fiddly in there, and the new the new concept can't work at all, right? So there's a... Or, yeah. or what happens with most of the, like, if you look at Games Workshop, if you've got a rule set that's like four or five years old, they've just added stuff on. It's like plug-in, 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 so it just gets so clunky by the time it's ready for a new set. There's no choice. Right. Exactly. Yep. So I wanted to talk a little bit. So this is interesting. So I, I love what Steamforge is doing. Now, Steamforge, I think they're they're pushing the envelope in terms of the, staying. There's going to be a regular release, and they're saying, you know, printing's much more affordable now because you know technology, uh, and so it's okay to reprint cards every year. It's okay to reprint uh, books every year. Privateer is taking a different approach, which is I, they just announced a big change, and it's it's interesting, and I I think. It's harder in a way, um, but I'm, I'm curious to see what you guys think of this, and I'm really interested to see how this works out for them. So mm-hmm. they released Mark III uh, not that long ago, last summer, and um, unlike Mark II, so when they did Mark II, they did a bunch of beta testing with the community. Uh, yeah. And Privateer admitted this was very painful. It was very expensive. It was a lot of work. They think that the, the version of the game came out was their best ever. They even have said that Mark II came out cleaner and better than Mark III did. Um, however, they noticed there was a lull in their sales and it was expensive for the company. And so they tried not to do it with Mark three instead of Mark three. They thought they could kind of, kind of go back to internal testing and somehow do it that way. And it didn't work as well. Uh, you know, I haven't really had any problems, but I don't play competitively, but I know that some people run into like the score faction is kind of a mess right now. And other, there's some other issues and privateer to their credit said, well, that's a mistake. Let's change that. We want to go back. But they're trying to go to what I would call in software closer to a continuous release model. So in software, what you can do is you can have staged event releases like Steamforge is doing once a year or maybe once every six months or monthly even. 
But really progressive software companies like Facebook, for example, release continuously. As a developer fixes something, it goes straight into production. And so Facebook has like literally hundreds of releases into production a day. They just happen. So privateer is trying to get somewhere closer to that, not daily, obviously, but to the point where they can just release fixes as they are found and tested for particular models as they want. And so to do this, um, what they've said, they just had a big announcement, um, kind of a mea culpa for the Mark III issues. And here's what they're going to try to do. So they're going to go to public field tests, which is what you were just describing, JJ, earlier. Um, Going forward, there's going to be four to six week tests going on almost all the time for the next set of model upgrades or models coming out. So if it's a new faction, a new model, or just a change, those will be going on all the time. You can be involved in those betas. They're going to remove all the stats from their books. There's no longer going to be any stats, any model-specific rules in any of the faction books. Instead, those will focus on the fluff, the background, and the hobby, right? There'll be more sections on painting and colors and all that sort of stuff, and you know, logos and banners, whatever. Um, there will also no longer be stat cards with any of the models. So when you buy a model, you don't get a stat card either. And their plan here is to go ahead and they're hopeful that most people are using War Room. I know War Room gets mixed reviews. It works fine for me, but again, not everyone gets the same mileage out of it. I know if you're an Android user, it's a little rougher than if you're an iOS user. Uh, but It's much they're, rougher. Their idea is that, hey, you have this app. All the data is, this is like software now. So we can get our rules to you via software. So those can be updated at will. And um, also for those who don't use the app, they're going to put PDFs out there. You've got to print them out yourself, but they're free. And they'll do print-on-demand technology. For those of you who really want a card, you can ask for a card to be printed. And you can get them as often as you like. And they're going to have a living errata, which is essentially release notes in software. So they're going to have a web page you go to and see all the changes. Um, but if you have the rule book on your phone and you have the model stats on your phone, you have all the latest. You don't have to go read the latest FAQ and go to 16 different FAQ documents. I think this is a really interesting approach. Um, it's very bold. I, I'm really curious to see how effective they can do it. What do you guys think about this, this angle? Mm. You go first, Craig. Uh, well, you'd lose me. Um, I, uh, I, I would be nervous about, um, not knowing which generation, like you'd have to check the web or the, or the app. If I have not been able to get, I tried to play war machine three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and I couldn't get, um, war room to work. No matter what I tried to do, I couldn't log in. I couldn't get through. I finally got through on my tablet, but then couldn't open any of my cards. So I ended up not playing. So there's like, I mean, that's one tiny little anecdotal story, but that's one, like I didn't play at all. And then the next few opportunities I had to like, maybe I would have gotten more excited. Maybe I would have bought more models. None of that happened because I couldn't play the game. So if I'm having that much trouble, but I'm a really solid war machine player, but then I have to get my stuff offline. That means I have to go check online before every game to make sure I'm playing with the same generation everybody else is playing. It requires a level of engagement on a totally different facet of the game than the traditional model. Now, I'm not saying that's wrong. Maybe that's just the way it is, and Luddites like me get left in the dust and we're Neanderthals. But um, but it does it does require that this whole new facet uh, be created or is has been created and now has to be engaged with as opposed to just you have your book you have your cards that are in your case when you want to play a game you just bring your case you just whip out the cards you flip through it and, you, and you're on on the way to the races so it makes me very nervous what do you think jj i it makes me nervous but for different reasons um the i i, I find that these hobbies, miniature wargaming is not a cheap hobby to begin with. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're all, we, we all know how much the, the plastic crack costs and, and how much we've all invested in it over the years. Um, but to me, making it an app-based delivery system for stat cards when the only other mechanism to really get them is, you know, a print on demand because ultimately you're going to want to have them in sleeves and, you know, dry erase markers and all these sorts of things. If you all of a sudden your price point now includes a tablet to be able to access an app – to be able to get your rules for the models you've already paid for, that's a very different price point entry for, let's say, new gamers and even younger gamers that want to get into the hobby. That to me is it's it's saying privateer press is basically saying we don't want young gamers. We want people with high disposable incomes that or people that already have access to the technology or have access to multiple devices so that they can access all of these things and work on that basis. So I think while it could be kind of good in terms of making sure 
they they can do these regular updates i think they're putting a barrier to entry into their into their market which is not a good idea or they're relying on other companies like your games workshops of the world to you know break people into break people into miniature wargaming now they're already invested they've seen this other game they're going to go spend the money anyway and that to me is a mistake in and of itself just on a business sense but that's that's one part of it i guess the the other thing that really bothers me about some of this is that a four to six week playtest period, depending on the number of people you've got, is not enough. Mm. It's completely insufficient. And Privateer Press, in terms of its beta testing, has only demonstrated it cannot do it well. Right. So to say that they can pull this off on that public field test and synthesize that information and deliver it in a four to six week period based on their track record of playtests <laughs> is just not erroneous. Good. <laughs> it's never going to function well. Yeah, I think, well, I, I, so I agree with you on the beta testing. I think that is something they're going to have to really work and evolve and figure out their time period. And I, I'm, I think they're very optimistic on four to six weeks. So we'll see what that is. Um, yeah. <laughs> I will disagree with you guys, though, on the phone thing. So um, they may be a little ahead of their time on this. Uh, but so my daughter has been playing since she was 10. Um, and now, again, I'm, I'm a very specific target market for this, right? But I'm a geek dad who... Um, I like technology, so I have a phone. She started playing initially on her um, on her um, iP- iPod, right? And she had War Room on there, and it worked fine, and she's actually never used the cards. And she, what I like about this situation, when it works, if it all works, and it doesn't, I mean, no doubt, I've seen the Android problems, and I've had problems where mine won't do the latest thing or whatever, but when it does work we simply go to play at the hobby store and our cards are the latest versions and we pull out our, our iPhones and it just works. Um, and if I have a question on charging or slamming or whatever, I can go look it up and I know I'm reading the latest entry. Um, yeah. And so I, when it, when it does work, it is, it is great and it's seamless and it's nice. Um, and because I always have a phone in my pocket and most kids, you know, over the age of 12 pretty much do too. It's, I don't think it's much of a barrier. It is certainly a, uh, a barrier of affluence, no doubt, uh, but the hobby is that as well. So I'm not, I'm not really sure about that. But, but I do agree. The for this to work, uh, it's very bold. It's very risky. The app has to be flawless on all platforms. They still don't have a PC app, and I think that's a mistake. They need to get something for tablet users, you know, because you know surfaces and things would be fine on that, but you can't run it there. Um, they need to make the Android app perfect, and I do think they need to figure out their beta test cycle. I agree with you, JJ. I don't think four to six weeks will be sufficient. Um, for that, but I, I, I admire their, their going, their forward in this. And I'm kind of surprised. Has anybody else gone for a, a stat system, a digital stat system yet? I know a lot of people have digital army builders now that they support, like infinity ha- Corpus belly has one for infinity. Um, and Alpha is working on one, but do they actually have, does anybody else gone to digital cards, like real digital cards? I don't think there so. was a company I'm trying to think must be about five or six years ago now that developed a game called X illus. Yes. I, I don't know that. guys, you've ever saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that had that was a miniatures based game set on a grid system yeah. that you built your army and you put it all out on the table and did that, but you didn't actually roll any dice. Yeah. And all the rules and stats, because they had so many rules and stats, were set in the background of an app that sat next to that both players right. were using essentially while moving the models around the board, um, which allowed for some really interesting really interesting uh, interactions between the models and what was going on in terms of tracking morale, right. turn over turn, and other bits and pieces. It was a very interesting rule system. But for me, that went too far that way because you basically didn't need the models to play the game. Yeah. No. I had the same problem uh, with Gollum Arcana. Gollum Arcana was a similar situation, and I liked it. Um, but it was the same thing where most of the rules... So I think Privateer is trying to kind of add technology to the game but not make their game about technology. Uh, and they're mm. trying to solve a specific problem, which is how do we deliver the most current rules to you? Right. Oh, and by the way, there's an army builder here. And by the way, there's a way you can track damage. Um, I don't know. Yeah. It, but know. none of that technology is playing the game for you or right. rolling the dice or right. making the decisions. Exactly. You're doing all that on your own. But I yeah. still, um, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, but uh, of these two um, approaches between the Steam Forged approach and the Privateer Press approach. I, I, I still like the Steam Forged approach better, but cool. that might be because I'm a dinosaur. No, no, that's all right. Uh, well, I guess the, I guess I guess I don't disagree with you there because you know as a competitive player, 
you, what you don't want to do is rock up to a tournament and the night before a tournament when you've locked yeah. your lists in, done yes, everything, found right. out that Privateer Press has released this, pushed it out to War Room, and you've got this army and it's functioning really well and then you turn up on the day and you open War Room up and all of a sudden this army you've put down, all the rules yeah. have changed for it. Right. or at least some set of it has, or your your opponents have, and you now lo- no longer really know what's going on because all of your all of your work into understanding that is now essentially redundant. Yeah. Um, whereas Steamforge, you're just like, okay, there may be a slight hiccup in the rules for this one model or this particular thing, but we're all aware of it, and we're playing around of it around it, sorry, right. uh, for the next twelve months, and then it's going to be fixed. It's all going to be changed, but we're all aware of it now, and we know it's not going to change overnight. Yeah, and a, you yeah, exactly, you know when it's going to change. I mean, we saw. Interestingly enough, to compare, we saw this at SteamCon where the uh, Season 3 rules had come out. And so everybody was transitioning from Season 2 to Season 3 over that weekend. Mm-hmm. So that was very interesting where you saw like the World uh, Finals and everything were still Season 2 because those guys were working on that you know, that level of, of competitiveness and, or you, I should say you guys were working on that level of competitive <laughs> and, comp- and, and, you know, and performance. And changing the rules on you would have changed everything and would have been not been a clear reflection of who had done the best over the course of the year. While everybody who was playing the more casual games in the um, Butcher Civil War event uh, all, over, all weekend long, we were using the Season 3 rules. So you kind of had a lot of adjustment. And you guys who were doing both were making an adjustment from game to game. So that's kind of like what you're looking at happening on uh, on an uh, not not once a year if and and your words there jj really struck a note with me uh because that i i have a hard time learning the rules and then once i've learned them i i have them i know them in my head i mean everybody jokes that i don't play war machine but i know the rules you know better than a lot of the guys who play it every few weeks now that's not going to happen if those rules and those cards are changing willy-nilly without warning without schedule and that would make me that would make me very nervous. It was interesting and fun at SteamCon because everybody knew it was going to ha- happen, basically, and it was sort of neat to watch it as it happened. But if that's something that becomes part of the gaming culture for a particular game company where you don't know on the eve of a convention or an, on the eve of a tournament what's going to change, um, it could be very nerve-wracking. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, really definitely. Really I guess point. the other great thing about where th- having that roll out over SteamCon was you had every single one of the game's developers in right. that hall as mm-hmm. things were going on. Yeah. So if you had any query about how my- this minor change was working or you didn't know, you had the guy that wrote the rules mm-hmm. standing yeah. right next yeah. to you and they were just like, bam. Or part of the internal playtest team or just about a representative from nearly every playtest group they have in the world was in that room as well. So if you were ever doing anything they were more than happy to just turn around and go, actually, you might want to look at this and this. Yeah. And you just proceeded, which was which was really great because you had all these people that had the experience from the playtest periods and from the design, design experience to help you out with exactly what you're talking about. Yep. Yeah, that exa- and that happened to us on more than one occasion where we would have a question and there was somebody right there who knew everything about it who could jump in and help out. Yep. So let's which on. is oh, which is not a realistic expectation, of, you know, on, on a regular basis for most game companies. But it was awesome to uh, to be there for that kind of a, a rollout. I think Privateer yeah. tried it similarly, right? They launched Mark Three at Lock and Load, that's true. International event on the same day, and they were all there. Um, but I, I but I, I but I, they've I, backed down on the whole Mark Three. Re, um, well, you're right. I mean, I think the release is, model. Now. Yeah, I think I think you're I think you're both right. I think they're going to have to figure out. Um, I, it's going to be fun to watch this. I, I think some the answers. I like the idea of being able to distribute changes quickly and easily, but I do think scheduled releases are essential. So we'll see where where Privateer yeah. ends up. It doesn't mean they couldn't, right? They could certainly do that, but we'll see. I think I think Steam Steamforge Games though has a system that's definitely going to work for them, um, and I think both companies yeah. are trying to lever leverage the idea that reprinting our stuff annually is not as expensive as it used to be right so that's right that's oh I, I i definitely think ultimately what's going to happen is something in the middle of these two approaches right and i don't know if scheduling releases i don't i like, i think you could easily get away with every six months maybe right but right. you get shorter than that and you're going to get these guys who are at the very very cutting bleeding edge of competitiveness who right. need time to adjust and absorb and adapt 
And they're not going to be able to do that if you like reduce it much beyond six months, I don't think, yeah. you know, so if it, it you're, you're going to be fighting on sand every time you come, if it's, you never know exactly what you're going to be meeting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, that's, I think that's completely fair. And the other thing that will do is when you've got things like these playtest groups, if you are going for that regular release cycle, anyone involved who you've already got involved because of how well they play the game or whatever aspect you're trying to test they're getting access to all of these rules four months in advance from the general release. So they're coming into that new release schedule so much that they, they, they were already sort of at that cutting, bleeding edge that you were talking about. Yeah. But then they're coming in on this release date on a six month schedule, four months ahead of everyone. They don't need right. that advantage. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, right. it doesn't make yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Uh, yeah, I'd be interested to see how they how they deal with this. I'm also it, interested to see if any other companies are trying to solve this problem, right? Have we seen any other gaming companies try to figure this out? Um, I think most of them are still are still. I think only Privateer and Steamforge are kind of on the on the leading edge of this. Everyone else seems to be sort of still uh, back on the FAQs and books, just as needed, sort of thing. Right. Yeah, I, I think interestingly, Games Workshop have done something which I think they should have done a long time ago, but uh, which is to take a step away and say, we're not going to make a competitive game anymore. Right. right. And, and we're not going to support this as a competitive game. So all of our games, like you look at the Age of Sigma rules, they're what, like three and a half, four pages long. Right. Yep, they're right. super loose, super, super cut down, and it's just designed about going back to Games Workshop's original like um, company manifesto of we just want to have fun. We want to take the Dungeons and Dragons world and look at putting those heroes in charge of big armies and being able to roll dice and see what happens with it. Right. And so rather than trying to keep up with this release schedule and FAQs and book releases and trying to fix things all over the place, they've gone, no, stuff it. Like, we're glad you guys like to play these games competitively, but that's not the game we're trying to make. We're trying to make a game that's fun, that lets you do cool stuff. Here's a set of rules that lets you do that. If you want to play that in a tournament, go nuts. We're not going to keep up with it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's actually another really good way of handling things is just being like, we get that there's that community, but we're kind of, and, and those cutting, those cutting edge, you know, diehard, diehard, um, competitive guys are there, yep. but they're such a small part of our market. What we want to do is we want to make a game that people are going to enjoy and that people can have fun with. And it's going to, it's not going to be a tight rule set and we're not going to make it a tight rule set. Right. So yep. live with that. And I think that's just as valid a way of getting around this problem is you just remove the problem. That's a good mm -hmm. point. Actually, now, they're doing something really cool too. Sorry, Craig, I'll let you go in a second. They, yep. they are, they're also leveraging the ease of delivering digital rules. So they're adding layers to their game, right? So there's the very basic simple rules. Then they've added new digital books that let you, you know, ha if you want an army list, you can make one, right? right. And they're well, adding, what we've been told is that yeah. the, com the complexity of the game comes in those data sheets. Right, so they're using you know, those un the units themselves. Yeah, there's optional hmm. rules you can layer in to add complexity, to add more detail if you want to. It doesn't turn it into a tournament game, I don't, I don't think. Although people are using it that way, I think it does more to just, just add the depth you want. And so I think it's they're, they are doing a very interesting approach, JJ. That it's it's worth pointing out that they're going for instead of doing FAQs and everything, we'll just add as much complexity or as little as you want. And the core game is very, very straightforward and simple. And it's really all about getting models on the table and chucking dice. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I've got, I've been contacted by a fair few people here in London to help them develop the age of Sigma rules into helping them remake games like Necromunda using those rules right. and using those systems because they want to play Necromunda, but they don't like second ed 40k rules. Right, they really right. like the Age of Sigma rules. Like, what can we layer on top of that that lets us get the feel of Necromunda without having to use second ed 40k? Uh, mm. Doing the same thing with things like Inquisitor and Gorkamorka. So people are asking me, oh, what could we do with this rule set? And what should we add in here and here and, you know, look at these data sheets and how that all plays out? Right. What can we do? So, And I think that's really cool as well. I mean, it's, you've, you've got this um, really really interesting set of community engagement which when you look at games workshops most most successful games um outside of the the, the big two obviously you, you're talking about things like epic 40k mm -hmm. uh, and blood bowl which 100 percent got taken over by the community and then right. wrapped back up into games workshop and re-delivered yeah that's that's where they've seen huge amounts of strength is when they've let something go go we're no longer supporting this what's what can the community do with it and then they've had this huge amount of engagement 
and had some amazing outcomes from it. Mm -hmm. And they're now starting to do that with their main games and giving people a lot more freedom. Mm -hmm. I think that's I think that's done really good stuff for them. Yeah, yeah. That, it's really and interesting. and interestingly enough to follow up on what JJ was talking about with uh, Games Workshop looking at their um, their player base and deciding where to go. If you look at these companies that and we've talked about this already in the past, what the companies that are looking at data and again specifically Steam Forged because they're you know fresh in our minds. Uh, one of the main things that came out of their um, their uh, their uh, big uh, their big presentation was. The 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 decide the understanding that that wasn't a huge portion of their player base was the, the these competitive people and so they that allows them to do kind of the same thing but they've got a game already that's really tight and really good for competitions so kind of lets them expand on that and target those audiences that are more um that are more likely to be buying models and buying you know buying into the game and playing the game. So it's a really interesting uh, kind of intersection of of uh, technology there. Great. Well, we're starting to run a little long, so I, I we probably should wrap up here. But uh, that was good stuff. So really, much more technology, there is, But well, I just it turned up being a, a rules distribution. But I think that's excellent because I think that's the biggest problem we have. We'll have to save our our ideas about. Uh, 3D printing and everything for another a future show, I think. Right. Well, I, I think the rules distribution thing is where is where everybody is right now. I, it I, is. is yeah. So that's uh, it makes sense that that's where we spent and a lot of time. And I think it does time. kill a company, right? If they can't figure this out, um, it's a big problem. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they're not getting very far if they can't get their rules distribution that's, right. So. That's right. <laughs> right. So right. get that done. Well, you got to be able to make the models too. So that's that's another part. But they that, that's, that's true. That's largely uh, similar across the board. So yeah. all right. Well, thank you, JJ, for joining us. We're going to take a quick break. And we come back with JJ and more and right after this. This is Total Fangirl. Regular Jane most days, Total Fangirl when the moment strikes. Han shot first. Starbucks is a guy. And Lestat, now there's a vampire. Hey everyone, this is Nicole, your Total Fangirl. You can follow me on Twitter at Nicole Wakeland or check out my blog, TotalFangirl.com. The shout out this week is to our wonderful supporters over on Patreon. Head to Patreon.com slash the D6 generation and you too can support the show. So it, I've been home for a couple of weeks, which is kind of nice. And we got all sorts of home projects done. And then after that, we've been hanging out just kind of doing nothing as a family, which is sort of a, a rare treat for us to have weekends where there's not a million activities to fill them. And we came upon a show based on a book and it's it's fantastic. So I have to recommend it to everyone. The Lemony Snicket's a series of unfortunate events. It's I want to say 13 books. 13 is the final one. And it's about two orphans. Uh, their parents are killed in a fire, and it's the unfortunate events that happen to them. And I've never read the books, although our youngest apparently read almost all of them uh, quite a few years back. And now they have a series on Netflix. And honestly, it's kind of like, okay, whatever, I'll, I'll watch it. We don't have anything else to watch. Let's hang out with the kids and, you know, just chill and eat pizza on the living room floor and watch this movie. Or watch the series. So we started watching it and it's hilarious. And it's so good, in fact, that Kit, who hasn't read the books in years and has sort of forgotten bits and pieces, wanted to go and get the rest of them. And so we went back to the bookstore and we got the two, I think, or three that she had not yet read. And now she's got her nose in a book all day, which, you know, what parent is going to complain about their kids spending their day reading? So that was a good thing. But the series itself is really, really funny. It's very quirky, uh, sort of, you know, in line with what the books are like. My daughter tells me they are somewhat different. So they're some big differences. So if you've read the books, the characters are the same, similar idea, but there are some big changes. But there's only eight episodes in the series. So series one is just eight episodes, and it covers the first four books that were written. And each, like the first two episodes are book one, <clears throat> then episode three and four, book two. So there's each, each book is told in two episodes. And then I did find out that they are actually already approved and green lighted for a uh, second series or second season. This will be 10 episodes, so it'll be five books, which leaves three. What, 10, 8? I don't even know my math. How many books? At least some books at the end there that hopefully they're going to get the last few books done in a third series, but that one hasn't been approved. But they're trying really hard to get it done because the series is about two kids and kids grow really fast. So you can't really film a series about little kids 
and have it span the course of 10 years of filming because then your little kids aren't little kids and the whole thing gets messed up. So hopefully there'll be a third season because this is really fantastic and it has some incredible actors in this. Neil Patrick Harris, he plays Count Olaf, who's the lead bad guy, and he's sort of campy, and you see lots of uh, Dr. Horrible in there. You can sort of see that sort of campiness shining through. He's He is absolutely hilarious. Then you have Patrick Warburton, who I will always think of as the tick. The, I don't care how many roles that guy actually has, he is the tick. And he plays Lemony Snicket, who is the narrator who tells the story and he occasionally just pops in there and he you know tells you in his very deep voice and his very well, it was just still just the tick he tells you about what's going on and you know gives you a hint about what's happening and and he's very very funny and then there's other actors that like pop in all over the place like they have these they don't have huge roles or at least they don't at this point and because i've watched we've watched four episodes of it so we're about halfway through and they're really fantastic actors. Will Arnett is in there. Joan Cusack is in there. Colby Smulders is in there. I even saw, because I went and looked, in one of these episodes somehow, Don Johnson plays in a couple of episodes. So it's this revolving door of interesting cast members who make an appearance to basically tell the story of one book and then disappear. It's very, very funny. It's very, very sharp. They're, the baby in this, first of all, she's the most adorable child ever. But she's, I think Russ said she's his favorite character because she's just so silly. She babbles like a baby, but her babbly words are uh, subtitled at the bottom of the screen. And she's this sarcastic, smart uh, little character. She's hilarious. So if you have kids, cause it's not scary at all. And it's just really kind of fun and quirky, uh, especially if they've ever read the books, break out the show and watch it. It's on Netflix. Go ahead and watch the show. Sit down and, and check it out. And it's really a fantastic way to spend a few hours, especially if you happen to be one of the people who's stuck inside during the crummy weather this winter. You're listening to the Dice Tower Network at Dicetowernetwork.com. More fun than Merchant of Venus. Wait, what? Who writes these? Hey, welcome back. And so, I mean, we have alluded to the fact that JJ is um, uh, deeply connected to the Guild Ball uh, community. Uh, he's involved in the playtesting of all mm-hmm. the cool new stuff. And he uh, clearly knows more about it and and even some War Machine stuff than uh, Ross or I. <laughs> And so we thought we, uh, of course, Guild Ball Season 3 came out at SteamCon and we played it a bunch and we talked it up a little bit. Um, And there may still be a lot of people out there who don't have access to Guild Ball Season 3 yet because it's only available in the kickoff box right now. Um, So we thought, why don't we actually go through those changes and how do they change? Maybe if you tried Guild Ball Season 1 and it wasn't really for you, maybe some of these changes will turn you around. Uh, so, um, and a special thanks to MidwestWarGaming.com for the summary that the uh, following segment is based on. Yes. Um, and uh, so, uh, first, JJ, we haven't heard from you in a while, and we had, I, I don't know uh, in this in this episode, have we talked at all about where you've been since World's End Radio, uh, since you parted ways uh, with that and your home country at the same time? Yeah, I think. Uh, yes. Well, I'm now in London. Yeah, so we've been through yeah. been through a lot of that. But yeah, no, it's all okay. it's all. I mean, I haven't done any more podcasting sort of stuff. If that's what you're alluding to, uh, yeah, just you know, seeing where you're I've going. been. Yeah, yeah. No, I've done some other like guest spots and stuff though, so it's been all right. Keep been pretty okay, busy. Cool. And of course, we ran into JJ. Keeps it, yeah. SteamCon got some games and watched you played. Um, and uh, JJ, I was really impressed with uh, how quickly all the veteran. Um, sort of guild ball players there really got into season three and you know there wasn't a lot of you know uh turning noses up at the new rules it was more like whoa this is this is so much better and this makes the game i really see why they did this and so there's a lot more engagement and i I was really excited to see how much people were excited for the changes um and so i think it'll be a lot of fun to go through the individual ones what's really interesting about season three is there's not that many changes right it's not a super long list the game isn't completely different in any way but these some of these small changes have a major impact in in the game itself right 
Yeah, huge impacts. Um, actually, just just so I can clarify, one little thing that yeah. that was said in the intro: the, the the season three rules are actually free to download. So oh, that's right. They, that's you right. can only buy the book uh, as part of the kickoff set, but you can de- go and download them. They're released on the same day that's that right. kickoff came out. And you can so download the cards. You too. should one hundred percent be able to get them. Yeah. Um, yeah. I totally forgot. We're talking about Steam. Uh, Steam Forged here. They take care of it all. <laughs> yeah. So so the cards and the and the um, what's yeah. the the rule book is all up yeah. there. So free, yeah, you can free, get all free. of that. But yeah, I mean, if you look at the changes, it was that they are very minor. Uh, the core rule set, you know, season two was was brilliant. I, I didn't really have any problems with it, and the little problems that were there. Um, now I must, you know, you said I'm involved in, in Steamforged. I'm I'm a little bit, but not not really, and uh, no, I'm the, not, with, I'm not privy the, to too much, so no, I don't do, represent so you, the company you, you in any with, way. No, no, no. But you help them with playtesting and stuff. Yeah, right? yeah. But that's yeah, a relatively that's, recent thing. So okay. um, this, if you look at what some of the changes are in season three, uh, you look at the plot cards from season two and how they worked. Um, so things like mascots initiative and um close range goal scoring were all plot cards in season two right, right. and the what basically season two and the impact of those plot cards and the positive play experiences they created ended up forming in my opinion I, i'm not i wasn't part of this decision making process but those those few things actually gave the play experience a lot more. So people were choosing those cards mm-hmm. as plot cards, even though they weren't necessarily the best tactically, they may, they, they just kind of enhanced the game experience that much that Steam, it looks like Steam Forge should have taken that feedback and rolled that up into the core rule set rather than making you spend a plot card on it, which is a really great way of doing things, I think. Yeah, that's very cool. I agree. Well, let's jump into those changes and what, what they were. So I think one of the first ones, um, well, uh, Let's start with mascots. This is just, I, I grabbed this from uh, Midwest Wargaming, so I didn't miss anything. And they happened to put mascots first. Um, and I don't, this is an interesting change, and I it was one that I didn't really, um, you know, I didn't play a lot of season two. I played enough to be dangerous. Um, but um, how did the mascot rules change, JJ? So in season one and two, mascots had no icy sponge uh, token, mm-hmm. which meant they couldn't return to the pitch. So Guild Ball works on a six model. Each player has six models and therefore has six activations. So if you killed your opponent's mascot, you gave yourself an activation advantage. Um, so allowing them to return was something that really brought a lot of balance back to the game. Uh, because as soon as you've got an activation advantage in any game that you know is on an alternating activation, you can stall out scenarios, you can do things um, that you wouldn't normally be able to do. So I think allowing the mascots to return was a really positive move in that way. Mm -hmm. But by the nature of the mascots being able to return and then being relatively easy to kill, like low hit point, low defense, um, not very high impact models on the, on the game other than their activation, they lowered the number of victory points uh, that you score when you kill them from two to one. Mm -hmm. So them coming back with 50% of their, you know, eight hit points or nine hit points, whatever it is they have to start off with, you only get one victory point for taking them out, which means they're no longer that big a target. Right. Uh, you know, when you're getting two victory points for taking out a, a weaker player instead of one for a mascot that's not going to have that big an impact on the game, mm-hmm. it means that their their presence on the field, you can actually be you can actually be a lot more reckless with them. Right. Yeah. Because uh, I know, like, when I used to play fish, um, I used to have salt. I used to just dump salt in front of the goal, use him there to deny my opponent one dice. Mm-hmm. essentially to shoot on goal or then to force them to send a player out to kill salt which would put that player so far out of position that it gave me a number advantage somewhere else on the pitch right. that sort of thing now with salt i i've been playing him so aggressively i i mean salt now is one of my main goal scorers because <laughs> there's not a lot of value in trying to kill him and he's super mobile uh-huh. uh and he's an and otter of, we should say Hmm? He's an otter, also, right? So he's like he's a, a cute oh, yeah, yeah. otter. So, yeah, he's a cute otter. So an That's otter it. is your number one scoring goal player on your team, which is just fantastic. I love, I love the idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> it's actually it's it's actually a lot of fun because people get worried about you know your sharks and all the rest of it is the strikers, and then all of a sudden this otter comes and scores <laughs> when he was twenty four inches away from the goal, and all of a sudden he's scoring with like one dice needing threes, and he's like, yeah, stuff it, roll it, and then you score the goal, and the otter's out of position. They're like, I'll go kill the otter. You're like, I just scored four points. You're getting one back. Like, I don't even care. Uh, <laughs> You just your risk versus reward payoff is is really good, right? Um, um, Matt is not going to like the impact this has on sales. 
<laughs> he doesn't like right? solid sails. I think right. I, I like this this change a lot myself because um, the the mascots feel kind of right now, right? Like they feel like mascots. There, there are some places where they can really do well, like with salt. But for the most part, you feel like, well, it's it's you know, I can kill him, I can ignore him. He's there, he's annoying, but he's not like he's not as they're running around causing mischief. Right? They they feel right to me now. I really I really like this mechanic, and I like that they come back. I you know I. Um, Killing them off seemed wrong at some point to me, but yeah, yeah, it's brought them back into the game because they were they were not a huge part of the game all the way through seasons one and two. There were a couple of mascots that were significantly stronger. Um, Marbles from the Masons, for instance. Yep, I mean he was the the, the in guild access to tooled up, and you had to take him, so he was just. He was an auto auto include, like you never took Wrecker. It was p- pretty much pointless, um, and you ran him and did that. And then you looked at compared to Salt in in season two, you, the, the disparity was huge because you could be reckless with marbles, and it gave you so many advantages to the rest of your team. Whereas Salt, it was only a negative if anything ever happened to him. Right. Uh-huh. Um, so it's it's brought them back to a level playing field, I think, across the board, and just it's just opened up the game a lot more gives you a lot more options on the pitch cool nice yep. all right let's talk about my new favorite rule i i love this rule um and how did they change they made a very simple change to the initiative system right and that is that um the player who does not gain initiative gains a free momentum right and how did that work in in season one uh or season two jj Season two was if well you just didn't get you the initiative get it, right. if you didn't have if you didn't have initiative you didn't get the momentum if you were going second. Um, so what this has done is and this is actually another rule that everyone thinks is a change but has been there and mm. I think when we get down to well this kind of works with the mascots as well and and with the icy sponge rule um, I'll explain a scenario after we get to the icy sponge stuff I guess um, but. When you roll off for initiative in Guild Ball mm-hmm. in Season 2, there was never any advantage to going second. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you won the initiative roll, you got to make the choice. And this is something that a lot of people didn't realize. They just Because, because there was never any advantage to it, no one ever chose to go second. Right. You'd roll and just go first because it meant you, you were activating first. You could control position, influence allocation, do all the rest of it, and just proceed. <laughs> You did always have the choice. That's something that's sort of a misnomer of a change. Um, Just no one did it. Now, there's actually a choice to be made in a lot of people's opinions. So now everyone, that's why it's a perceived change. Um, When you roll off for initiative, if you've got the most momentum, you win that roll. Mm -hmm. If your opponent's not in a position to do any damage to you, to get the ball off you, or do anything like that, you can choose to go second. To get the momentum, right. Get the momentum, which then means your striker that's sitting out in the wing that can't generate momentum themselves if you go first mm-hmm. now has the momentum to take the goal shot. Yep. So you, you, when you're looking at your pitch scenario, it's not just a snap decision to go first. It's a, well, do I need the momentum or is the only person they, go, they, can, they can possibly hit, do, do they have a low knockdown? And does that momentum actually give me a cancellation of six influence on their side of the board. If the captain comes in, I knock them down and the activation and, you know, jog on. Right. So you, you've actually got some really interesting choices to be made with initiative now. Um, because there was one, there was a card in season two called home crowd, which gave you that for one turn. Mm-hmm. So if you lost the initiative, well, if you didn't gain initiative, you, got you could choose that and get one momentum. Uh, like this, that was like this live field test essentially mm-hmm. um, through season two on this rule. And, it was. I think this has been a hugely positive change. Like my game so far, I haven't chosen to go first every time I've won initiative, mm. uh, and I've had players ship it over to me. But I've done. I, d- I did that in season two occasionally as well. But that's uh, probably a scenario to talk about after the icy sponge rule. Yeah, I, I love this change because for a couple reasons. One, I love that it adds decision making to the game. To your point, JJ, right? You don't. You don't really know which. Um, it's not always a, a slam dunk to go first. But the second part about it, I like is. You know what I? One of the mechanics of Guild Ball I really enjoy is the fact that whoever ends the prior turn with the most momentum has got an advantage on the initiative roll next turn, right? And um, what I like about this is if you're in a position where you really want to go first, but for some reason, you know, just the way everything bounced last turn, your opponent's got more momentum than you, and he's probably going to win that roll. At least having started with momentum in the next round, you have an ability to react, right? Because you can spend momentum to react in certain ways, counterattack or defense or whatever. So I really like this. Um, this opportunity, and I love I love rule changes like this, where the 
game companies figure out that a very small change that doesn't really require a lot of relearning of rules has a big impact. One of my favorite changes in Mark III is in, in War Machine was the idea that you get a free focus on all your warjacks that are in your control radius at the start of the, uh, the maintenance phase. That made a huge change to how the usability of warjacks in the game with a very simple rule change. And I think this is a similar thing where this simple rule change now makes losing that, you know, either making the decision or being forced to go second not quite as painful as it used to be and you don't feel quite as, you know, uh, disadvantaged by not winning that role. Exactly. Um, I mean, yeah, that is, that's exactly it. Because, you know, if you season two, you were just you were just stuck. So you'd have right. one player comes through six influence, yeah. does whatever they want. No way to stop it. Yeah, that's right. um, not not that's not fun. Exactly. No. Um, no, I've I've scored way. I, I've scored many goals based on this. Mm. Going second, you got one momentum, you got a person in position and they can get in. Yeah, it's awesome. I love it. Very good. So, JJ, you mentioned the third rule of this sort of set of rules that was sort of t- pioneered with uh, with plot cards, the icy sponge change. So how did icy sponge change? Right. So this wasn't this one wasn't actually done with plot cards. This was done off a little bit of anecdotal um, tournament play, which I may or may not have been responsible for. <laughs> so it used to be that you had two icy sponge levels uh, on your on your health tracker on your cards. So at the beginning of the maintenance phase, you would assign an icy sponge token to the player and you could spend that icy sponge token immediately and come back on the turn after you've been taken out at a reduced health level. So they used to be at about a third and two thirds of the way up your up your health tracker. Or you could keep the icy sponge token, stay off for a turn and not contribute influence to your team for that turn and come back on a turn later with two thirds of your health. What... Um, what was happening generally was that people were just coming back on with one third because having the player off, especially if your captain gets taken out or something like that, f- you're losing four influence in a game where you've only got 11 to 13 mm-hmm. or losing two where you've only got 11 to 13. That's It's a big hit. So you, you would always just come back on after one turn and that was that. Uh, very rarely did you ever stay off for two because I mean, this game can be over in three turns. So staying off for two means you're at, you're out of the game essentially. So it, it's now come down to one icy sponge uh, marker and you basically have to come back on the turn after you're taken out. You don't, you don't just sit off the pitch for a turn. So this looks like it's not a huge change. It kind of, you come back in with 50%, approximately 50% of your health uh, and get straight back into the game What's been really interesting when you start to combine that with the mascots that are returning and initiative, um, I'll, I'll give you a story that I had in like a semifinal of a tournament I was playing here. I was, we were basically tied at a roundabout at the end of the turn. Like my, my opponent was playing with Ox, used Ox as legendary and just ripped my fish team apart. Like just went from zero points, killed four players in the turn. I, I just, mm. everyone died. Yeah. Um, and that included the mascot that included salt, but he still had all six players on the pitch, but I'd, I'd scored two goals. So we're sitting there at eight all. I won the initiative role somehow. I think he rolled a one when he had like plus five or something. And I, yeah, I can't remember how that happened, but I won the initiative role and said, you can go first. And he's looked at me terribly confused. Uh, my two players were so far away from the rest of his team, I just wasn't even worried. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he then sets up all of his stuff thinking, I'm going to be bringing all of my players on, thinking, because he'd pushed a fair way up the pitch. So if I came back on, he'd just charge me and kill me, get his last four points. Like, right. It wouldn't have even been a thought process. Because of the two icy sponge rule, I then just said, I'm not bringing anyone back on. Uh, and my other two players are out of, out of range. Now, at this point, we'd both clocked as well. So... We're, we're on countdown for activations, but mm-hmm. I'm looking at the clock going, well, I'm on eight. You're on eight. I'm only going to give up two victory points this turn because I've only got two models on the pitch. Right. You're giving up six. So all Ooh. I have to do is let you go first, score a victory point, move a model further away. You go again, I get another victory point, oh. move another model away. And so I basically use the icy sponge rule to force my opponent to be clocked when I knew I couldn't lose the game by doing it. Oh, wow. Mm. Which is super janky and yeah, you know, that's pretty, pretty evil, terrible, but, like it. <laughs> but it's the rules, right? right. Um, so I, I deliberately like forced him into going first to make sure I got all of the points. Wow, um, I want to see his face. And, was just, wow, he must have been. Must well, have he been. didn't realize what was going on at first. Right. He's like, ah, oh, okay. And then, he, and then he realized as I started clicking up the victory point track, he's right. like, 
oh no i'm like yeah that's that's (laughs) this is how this game ends man like sorry but this is it wow (laughs) um Uh yeah so but it was a part of the game but that's that's not a positive play experience uh and steamforged are 100 like you listen to any panel about how they want this game to be played it's all about creating positive play experiences Uh, and that whether that's you know at home in casual games or in tournament games um so while i'm you know didn't create a terribly positive play experience for my opponent in that scenario i was still working within the rules and i think so i think changing this icy sponge rule to not allow things like that to happen especially in a timed game um uh, is a really positive thing and i think the other thing of bringing your players back on because you rely on that influence generation is another very positive thing because having them off for an extra turn is it's it just never happened right well, that's um, cool that's well i, I like i like it now because it's simple that's my <laughs> because i was right, never yeah. obviously played yeah. the game to that level before <laughs> but i just like how simple it is i found the icy sponge rule before a little bit confusing to me as just a casual player um, I like it now. It's just super simple. You come back, you have, you have your hit points on a where it's indicated on your track and you're good to go. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. It, that, that's it. It is a lot more simple to do. Uh, and there's no exploitation, which I guess isn't a big deal for most people. Yeah. I like it. Um, mm-hmm. cool. So the last couple of rules are, are, are pretty simple changes, but we should probably cover them. One of this, um, so there were some changes to goal kicks and kickoffs, but it's, but functionally, the game's the same, right? I just like how much clearer the wording is. Any anything there worth noting, JJ? No, I mean the only thing that really changed on that that was major was that they now, when you're kicking the ball out, because they've changed the marker terminology, um, you can measure the ball kick to the center of the ball, not hmm. to the edge of the base. Right. So you actually get an extra half inch in range on goal kicks um, and kickoffs, which is. You know, it doesn't seem like a lot, but it, it you know it can it can come into play sometimes. No, that's cool. Mm. Um, mm. And then they've added the um, tap in is now no longer a plot card. It's now a core rule of the game, which is basically when you're close to the goal, it's a little easier to kick the ball and right it goes through within four inches. It, it makes it one easier uh, for the target number on the dice, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think this is, again, this is a hugely positive change. A, a lot of people were finding it really confusing when you've got like the best striker in the game, um, like a Flint or a Mist or, you know, whoever that's sitting right next to the goal. They could be in base to base contact with the goal and it's no easier for them to score than it is from 12 <laughs> inches away. Right. And that doesn't make any sense, right? <laughs> um, but what it's done, if you look at some of the players that have very short goal kick ranges, like kick ranges. So someone like Hearn used to be a four inch kick, now a six, but um but Salt, for instance, has a four inch kick. So effectively, whenever Salt is making a goal kick, He's on they're threes, always right? doing it on a three. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Uh so it the other thing it does is it decongests the center of the pitch a bit because a lot of people were just going, right, I'm gonna take my eight inch goal threat, sit eight inches away from the goal or my ten inch goal threat and right kick from the middle which meant that everything was always clustered uh right. and and one of the things that if you look at like a lot of the season three rules it's trying to stop teams just forming these death balls and yes. rolling through the middle of the pitch together mm. and just clustering they want people to be using the pitch which is why you have on like some of the players like veteran spigot they've got paint the line so they gain they gain extra movement when they're wide you know they they brought all these wide player and play abilities to be region specific on the board Mm -hmm. which i think is a really positive thing to get people to use the board rather than everyone clumping in the middle and just bashing each other until the ball gets free and then scoring a quick goal i've noticed you know i hadn't really thought about it as rule changes but i i have noticed that when i used to watch guild ball i I remember seeing a lot more center play but in, in all the games i played in season three now i've several times noticed that we're ending up on the wings and i and a couple times to the point where players are like you know, veteran players will be watching, particularly at Steam kind of like, oh, be careful near the edges because if they knock you off, and I think what people, and that's a danger too, right, if they knock you off the pitch, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, but there's there's advantages to getting close and getting down the sidelines, right, and break the, breaking the center up. Yeah, exactly, and it's done amazing things because people are right. I mean, you got close to the edge, especially against like a fish team, mm-hmm. like you were off, like there was no way you were coming back. That's how fish got their takeouts, um, right. with shark anyway, was to just crowd surf people. Um, but now you have to play a wide game. There's, mm-hmm. there's too many things and you have to play a deep game as well, because sometimes 
you know, if you've got a three dice kick and you really need that goal, getting within four inches to increase that probability by, you know, a significant percentage when you've got, when it's, you know, three dice and four pluses and three dice and three pluses, that's a, that's a big percentage jump. Um, if you're if you're wanting to make sure things happen, you have to play in regions now, and I think that's a it's just a good thing for gameplay. I like it. Um, then the change that's been interesting is they changed the card layout a little bit. Uh, what what do you think, JJ, of the season three cards compared to how they did the layouts in season two? So this is actually the third version of the card layouts because the season two were vastly different to season one. Right. Yeah. Um, so. It's you know it, it just shows that they're listening and refining things, which is I think is a very positive thing. Um, I really like the season three layout. Um, I think there's a little bit uh, you know in listening and watching a couple of um, YouTube style match reports and things like that. There's been a few times or listening to early change logs and what people have been trying to pull off in games there's been a few bits of resistance to the change or at least a lack of understanding what the changes are in mm-hmm. the card layout. Uh, so the one thing that's the easiest thing to overlook is they've removed the terminology of once per turn from yes. from character plays, right? And they've made it a, a yes no tick, tick box basically that sits in a column next to the character play called OPT, now, right? Once per turn, yeah, right. yeah. Overpowered something? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the the interesting thing there is a lot of people have that have played season two especially have picked up the season three cards have reread the character play they've been used to playing in season two seen that the words are identical but that magic once per turn is missing yeah. uh, is no longer there and they get really excited and mm-hmm. they turn around with someone like ballista or deadbolt and go right. six six influence i'm going to shoot your guy knock him down then i shoot the next guy and knock him down right, i shoot right. the next guy and knock him down push all of them two inches away and do nine damage yeah no and you go <laughs> You can't do that because there's a little tick under this, and they they just like hang their heads. They're like, "This used to be amazing." <laughs> you know? right. um, I think it's a really. I think what it's done is it's just tidied the cards up a bit. Because mm-hmm. uh, if you remove those words, it just makes the character plays seem le- less wordy and less awkwardly worded. Right. Um, but if you're coming from the season two background and you're not a hundred, you haven't one hundred percent gone through it all. Yeah. It has been overlooked, so I think it's something people need to be a little bit wary of. Yeah. Um, I think it's I mean, good, though. I, I, I yeah. like it. War Machine did something similar not too long ago when they shifted and they made, you know, uh, it was a while ago now, but they added the continuous effect column and all that sort of thing, you know, are ongoing. I, I like I like it because you're right. I, I think for the veteran gamer who shifts over, he or she's got to relearn it, but it won't take them long. But I think for a new gamer, I always find it intimidating when I'm um, – if either I'm new to the game or new to the model and I'm trying to absorb what all the fancy rules are for this model are. And if each rule set is a really long paragraph, it's nicer to see it be very, very short and have a couple of icons that I know what they mean. Right. So I, I, yeah. I think it's a long term of definitely the way to go. And I, I think your, your tournament and veteran players will learn it really quick. Um, but there might be a little bit of grumbling while they while they're forced to relearn a little things. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was one of the things I saw at Steam Con. Like a lot of these guys just going, yeah. "Oh," and then you go, "No, no, that's that." Oh, I did it. <laughs> I, I, did, I was even a veteran. I, just, <laughs> I did it because I just read it. Because on the back, so on the back of the cards, um, there's the different rules in effect, and some of those things are also once per turn. But because it's not in the same format, they say you know once per turn or something on them. So I had one guy who had that on the back, but on the front had the OPT, and I didn't catch it. So even as a sort of a you know very casual player. I made the mistake once, but as soon as someone explained it to me, it was, Oh, that makes sense. And and away I went, you know, and shame on me for not figuring out what OPT meant (laughs) because it's clearly right there. It's (laughs) it's telling me. Look, when they were, when they were spoiling the season three cards before steam con in the lead up, I mean, they had like a, you know, six week window and they were putting up like what some of the changes were and what the thought process Mm -hmm. was behind the changes and all these sorts of things. So you had these cards and the OPT column was there with ticks and crosses. Mm -hmm. And there was all this speculation on the forum because no one knew what it stood for. (laughs) So they put this spoiler, spoiler up and then everyone's trying to figure out what opt meant and you know so many people just had no idea what was going on and <laughs> like didn't realize that once per turn had been removed and replaced with this cr- tick cross basis uh and then it was about a week before SteamCon. they went oh yeah and by the way as like a disclaimer at the bottom of one of their one of their blogs like by the way opt stands for once per turn and the entire <laughs> forums have just gone oh my god that's brilliant like <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So one thing I think is missing from Craig and I have commented on this both uh, to each other. I wish they had put and, and, and JJ, maybe you can explain how to do this, why they didn't do this or, or if there's a good reason for it. They don't actually have the version of the card on the card. So unless you know intuitively the layout changes of the card. So, for example, if you have a season two version of your of your team, 
or player on your team and a season three version of the, of the card for the same player without noticing the layout changes you don't really know which version of the card you have you know what i'm saying like there's not like a little v2 v3 in the corner or some icon on it that tells you which season it is um i, I wouldn't like that i think that's the only miss on the new card. i would love for them to show that just so i could i would know as a casual player oh i've got the latest version of the card that's i think that's a that's a fair statement i think one of the one of the things they've probably tried to do by not putting that on there, and this is purely speculation, is on the back of the card in the bottom right hand corner, you have a season number. Yeah, but that's the season that's the of season the, model. the player was introduced. Of the model, yeah, right. yeah not yeah. the yeah, exactly. It's, it's yeah, because different. I think there's going to be, you know, future formats there will be right. tournaments where it's season one and two only or season two and three only. So that limits right. your card selection. Right. That that style of um, tournament playing, play. Yeah, but you're playing the season one version of a character, but you need to be the season three card for the season one character. You know what I mean? Like, there's yeah, a right. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to think where you could put this on that card right. without causing confusion. Right. Because if you know, you put down, you know, Shark season three or right. version, you know, it'd have to be season right. three because you'd want to know which season the card's from. Yeah. And then it's got down the bottom in the bottom right hand corner, season one. It's like, well, is it season three or is it season one? What's the. <laughs> right. Um, right. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. Um, I don't, I don't, I have, don't have a suggestion either. <laughs> well, I don't know. But in any case, maybe an icon would be good. You know, because you just need the version icon. You don't need it to be anything. Um, if, they had, if they had like an emblem for each season, kind of like a logo, it'd be kind of cool. And then that would be your thing. I don't know. I can, you can take, take a hint from Magic the Gathering or something. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, what about the changes to how um, union players are used? I don't know that there was a big change in uh, casual play, but there was definitely some changes to organized play, right? Yeah, yeah, because this is something that's that surprised me a lot was people's reactions to this. Um, the only place that union has changed is is in is in organized play. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of people just play organized play rule for casual play because they want to go and play tournaments afterwards. Mm-hmm. But in casual play, you can still have as many union models as you want in your team. There's nothing stopping you do that. Right. It's completely legit. No worries. But in organized play, you can only have one union model in your nine-man roster now. Right. Unless you're playing union, of course, because otherwise that would be weird. Silly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I, th- I think this is a really positive change. A lot of people are like, oh, why can't it be two? Mm-hmm. Um, I think one has been if you look at a lot of the character play changes like global character play changes they've tried to change some of the better buffs uh, and auras and things like that to be guild only mm-hmm. um, there were teams that where you would see it would basically just be that the captain the the you know the guild captain the guild mascot and then three or four union players uh, because the the, the, the ability that the captain had was global. It affected union players and guild members, um, which then just kind of took away the point of having a guild in the first place. Right. Uh, it also meant you had auto includes. So everyone through season two was running avarice and greed mm, without, right. without a shadow of a doubt, because it gave you an extra activation. And right. if your opponent wasn't running avarice and greed, you're one activation up in a in an activation driven game, right. so you were ahead of the game before the game even started, and they weren't bad models. Um, Greed was a great goal uh, goalkeeper, sat in the way, did what he wanted to do. Avarice just went up and caused insane amounts of grief for people. Mm-hmm. Uh, as soon as you put that into something like a butcher's team, and then you have gutter and you start ramping up all this damage, it's it it started to feel like you weren't playing a butcher's team. You're just playing like this super enhanced union team, right? Uh, which defeated the purpose and meant that a lot of in guild players were not seeing any table time. So for instance, in, in the butchers, I mean, I can't remember the last time, well in season two or even towards the back end of season one, the last time I saw a boar on the pitch, I mean, he was just rubbish compared to the fact you could put gutter in your team. You're like, well, I'll just right. take gutter every time, uh, or meat hook for that instance. Um, and every guild was suffering from these in guild players that were not terrible, but, just didn't compare to the fact that you could replace them with a union player and as many union players as you wanted to replace the pieces you didn't want to have to field. So I think it's been a really positive thing. Um, The other thing it's done, I guess, is means they don't have to analyze the double unions because the the union players obviously bring out of, out of guild or things that aren't available to your guild in terms of character players. If they can start applying those two 
in guild models, you end up with some very, very overpowered uh, scenarios. So something like within the Masons, when you were running Honor and you had Decimate, you had the the Chisel missile, or you know. Um, chisile as it was called and the mallet missile and these sorts of things where you had two activations and you could (laughs) move this person up twice not spend any influence have five have five influence on them be engaging them kill a model score a goal in the first turn (laughs) and then because you killed a model and scored a goal you win the influence race and then you activate them again immediately with another full influence kill someone uh, or you know steal the ball and score again and by first activation of turn two you're on six to ten points uh, all because you've taken avarice and greed and decimate and you've set this whole thing up and you're pretty much laughing. Your opponent makes one mistake, you've won the game. Uh, it's It stops that happening, which I think is, again, a very positive thing. Uh, and it also means you, you're playing with the models you buy in your starter set. Right. Right. Uh, rather right. than buying a team going, oh, if I take out this and this and put in an entirely new union team with a different captain. Right. It's a better game. It's a better, better team for me. It's yeah. a better team. And right, it, right. But then everyone's doing the same thing. Right. Right. That's um, what I like. I like it a lot. I, I have always been sort of a, um, as, as a fluff guy, generally speaking, I, I don't, I, I, I respect and like the idea that there's these sort of, you know, mercenary type factions in most war games where you or, or you know, most miniature games you can swap out with your, with your list. But I always kind of th- feel like, it should not be a lot, right? It, you shouldn't change the flavor of the team you're going up against uh, exactly. massively, right? And so it always bothers me when when those sort of mercenary rules allow you to, to really make a team of essentially mercenaries with just just a nod to your your guys, right? So I like yep. it. I like yep. it. The other the other really big change in the union that I think is really being overlooked, um, and I really I really like this change. Um, and I called it at the at the end of season one. I'm like, you need. To, I think you need to change this to this. Um, and I'm so glad they did it. Was before it used to be listed on the union players' card which guild they could play for, mm-hmm. which meant in season one when they released all of the union models, they'd listed oh. out the hunters' guild, but the hunters' guild weren't released. Right. So they were having to preempt their release schedules and allow for allow for guilds to exist for union models that they haven't yet even done the playtesting for. Right. Uh, which is just a, you know, it means you're, you're having to factor in a bunch of union models that you're not really sure you want to fit into that guild, mm-hmm. um, which is which is a limiting for your design space and a bad idea. The thing they've done is they've added to each guild, they've added the a selected union players. Um, and so you get a, you know, with your guild you know, in the in the box of all the all the cards, the season three cards, each guild's got its the following union members are available to play for the Fisherman's Guild. And it has their names and the little logos for each of them. Now, what this allows Steamforge to do is release that card whenever a new guild comes out and force the playtest around that and and their design space. But Really interestingly, because Steamforge want to involve, um, want to show the dynamics and the the f- moving forward of the of the storyline, is as players die or as players actually fall out with guilds, um, you can then change from season to season the union models that are willing to contract two different guilds. So then, when I was saying like you go to these ideas where it's like season two and three only. You then have to look back at, or let's say it's a season three, season three tournament. So you have to use a particular captain. You have to use, you know, the models that were available in season three, and they list that out. You can then only use the union models that they introduce for that season as well, because right. it have a specific union available to your guild for that season. So it's it's giving them a, a really interesting design space and competitive and casual play area to work in to actually roll the fluff into the game a lot better. Yeah. Well, it makes the that, union feel like those free agents that can shift around from season to season, which I really I like. I like that change a lot too, JJ. I think that's a good. I think that's a good a good shift, and it just gives them a lot more flexibility, right? It's just really neat. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, and it also means that from season to season, let's say, you know, let's say they bring out new captains, mm-hmm. um, and all of a sudden, one of the existing union players from season three that could play for them doesn't fit with a season four captain, for example, uh, or is way too powerful. You can then just cut that union play for the roster in season four by just updating that card. Right. 
and it's just a, it's just a quick reference card with a bit of fluff on one side and a bunch of a list of union players on the other. Uh, it gives them a lot of scope in that in that design space to really make things work. Yep. And I think that's a, that's only a good thing. Excellent. So before we run out of time, I just really wanted to quickly ask you, those are all the major changes, right? That's pretty much right. it. Um, but I did want to quickly ask you, JJ, what your thoughts are now having played a few games uh, or more than a few games. Um, yeah. Have there been any significant sort of, I mean, we obviously can't go through every single team and every single card change for every, for every person on the team, but, but have there been significant changes to the feels of the teams or do the teams all feel about right? Was any team overly nursed or nerfed or leveled up a little bit or does it feel about the same in that respect? Um, I think the biggest change, and I, when I say the biggest, I mean just astronomical change, uh, was made to the engineers. Mm-hmm. Um, the engineers through season one and two felt a bit clunky, didn't really perform, um, didn't perform at a competitive level. And even on a fun level, they were incredibly difficult to use uh, and just didn't didn't work the way it looked like they, they were meant to work. Mm-hmm. You could definitely make them work, but you had to play them in such an obscure way uh, that it it didn't feel natural. Um, right. So the changes to the engineers in season three are, I mean, they, they've had the most card changes of any guild. Um, like just about every single player changed wow. in a very significant way um, to the point where you've got, got new character plays, new new playbooks, new, you just, you name it, it's probably changed on an engineer card, which has basically resulted in them becoming a lot more fun. I mean, there's some amazing new abilities in there that you just never would have dreamed of doing, um, which, you know, I think is, I think it's been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed playing the engineers recently. Uh, it's been, I, I tried them in season two and just, it just didn't function well. I was not, I was not having a good time. My opponent was just doing whatever they wanted and I couldn't stop anything. So I just got really frustrated. Uh, that could have just been me being bad at playing engineers, to be honest, (laughs) but you know, whatever. (laughs) Uh, but the new team is, is very much more, I mean, the engineers were designed to be a football team, uh, and they couldn't play football in season one and two. Now they can play football. Uh, they can play football really well, not, not as well as the fish say, but still do a very good job of playing football. So that's, that's been a really good positive change. Um, most of the other guilds have had little tweaks. Um, the, I'm trying to think if there's been any major nerfs. (sighs) Some people are whinging about a couple of, a couple of players here and there, uh, like within the butchers, people feel like Shank's been nerfed. I, I disagree. He was just too good before. Mm -hmm. Um, there's, I think, I think all in all, though, it's been very balanced. Uh, they've brought everything back so that everything is enjoyable to play. Mm-hmm. And when you put down a team, it doesn't feel like. I mean, Guild Ball's never been a rock paper scissors game, right? But there used to be some matchups where you put down, like someone put down a, an engineers team, and you were running anything bar Masons right. just about, uh, and you're just like, oh, well, I'm going to win this. Right? There's, right. there's pretty much no way I can lose this game. Um, that's not the case anymore with with any matchup uh, or any captain matchup. So I think they've done a lot of things to to really bring everything back on parity. Nice. Uh, so that's that's been good. No, there's no, been no real change to the overall feel of the teams. They all sort of work in the same way or their original yeah. in do- design intent. Uh, butchers still kill things really well. Mm-hmm. Fish still still score goals. Morticians still control things. You know that all those sorts of overarching themes are definitely still there. But I think they're just now in a, I mean, after two years of having a lot more games and, you know, a much wider set of feedback, I guess, Mm -hmm. um, got to a point where everything's, everything's sitting really nicely alongside each other. Uh, Yeah. And I think it's fair to say, I think it's fair to say that I I know the three of us really all like season three, but I think the community in general is really very pleased where, with where season three has gone. Right. I I think the feedback's been what I've seen, certainly at, at SteamCon, um, but, but even on the internet, I think everybody's really pleased with with where this has gone. Yeah, and, and I think you know not necess- you know, and I think a lot of that comes down to those like global changes we were talking about. I mean, a lot of the guys um, back in Australia that were playing like high level tournaments and stuff stopped, like stopped playing midway through season two because because of things like they they couldn't do anything if they lost the they lost the initiative role. Mm-hmm. Um, so they were like the games were getting a bit same same. Mm-hmm. 
Right. So I, I've got my six models. I know I've wrote, learnt my my plays, and I've got that. And I know that if I lose this, I've got nothing to do. Uh, and as soon as season three's come out, they're now very excited about the game and really enthused about getting back into it because, like you say, there's, there's a, a huge range of little changes, and then a, and a good nice you know balanced redo of all every player was reviewed and and redone where necessary um that 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 global change and move towards thing has really excited people uh because they're now engaging with a company that they know is you know has the best interests of the game and the players at heart and is only trying to do things on that basis um and when you look at the design team at steamforged uh you've got some of the you know some of the best you know, world team championships like lock and load players, mm-hmm. things like that from War Machine, they're now heading up the design space at Steamforged. That's awesome. And you can tell. You can you, you, can, you can tell, right? Yeah, 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 right. And and when when you start talking to people about how well a game is balanced, then you can turn around and go, Well, someone like Jamie Perkins is sitting there and he's the head, you know, head of development for for model rules and all the rest of it at Steamforged. I mean that guy was brilliant at War Machine and Hordes. Like no one in the world would ever dispute that. And he's a very, very good player and a very, very good, like very good at finding things and exploiting them. They've got this guy who's amazing at that, looking at all of their rules and trying to level things out and make things playable and fun. Right. I, I, there's probably very few people in the world I'd trust to actually do that and do it well, but Jamie's one of them. And he's only demonstrated that um, I mean, obviously the rest of the design team as well, but you know, someone like Jamie is someone you can 100% trust to, to make the tough calls right. and make, make big changes. So someone like Midas, for instance, you know, in terms, in terms of team sp- uh, specific changes, he was just a powerhouse in season two. Mm-hmm. Everyone who played with him loved him because he could do anything and everything, but anyone that played against him hated it. Right. Like it was just not fun. And so they completely changed his card. Wow. There's, barely any element that is the same like his legendary changed his heroics changed like all of his character players changed his playbook changed you know everything changed on him bar maybe like a couple of his stats but they were willing to make that call for the good of the game and there were no qualms in doing that and i think that's a really really positive thing i think that's one of the things that's got the community so excited is that you know they were they're willing to make those tough decisions and execute them well Exactly. Well, JJ, thank you so much for joining us on the show this uh, this time around. It's been a blast. It's been an absolute thrill to have you on. Um, And so if people want to know more about what you're up to and what you're doing online, where, how can they follow you on the internet? Uh, I'm on Twitter at JJ Layfield. Uh, So you can find me there. There's, I don't know. It's, it's a lot of Guild Ball, uh, a lot of gaming stuff. <laughs> You'll occasionally get some weird politically fueled weirdness and <laughs> philosophy because that's my thing now. Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, you can find me there. Um, I guess, you know, once you find me there, you can pretty much find me anywhere. So LinkedIn, Facebook, all those sorts of things. So yeah, feel free to add me. Go nuts. Awesome. Well, JJ, thank you again so much well, uh, for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time on your busy yeah. schedule. No, yes, I appreciate coming so on, guys. It's been uh, been a real pleasure and, you know, known you guys for years. So it was great to meet you at SteamCon and finally come on the show. It's been fantastic. It and I time. promise that next time Luke is on, I will call him JJ. Ooh, that would actually call. drive him insane. So <laughs> yeah, please do. Know, definitely do that. Excellent. All right. <laughs> and we'll have you back on again soon, JJ. We will. Yeah, perfect. Right. Sounds great. Awesome. Take care. Brought to you by all of our fine friends over at Patreon. These are the men, women, and children who have stepped up to become a part of the D6 generation and help us put on these shows that we just grind on and on and on. Thanks today to Jason Ledoux, Jason McFarlane, Jason Sally, Jeff Lane, and Jeffrey Morgan. Thanks to you and all that you do. Did you ever notice how poisonous the term what if can be? I mean, it's a tricky question because the term what if pretty much preceded most of the amazing advancements throughout human evolution. Uh, What if I get out of the water? What if I get up into that tree? What if I get down out of that tree? What if I farm instead of just trying to pick this rotten fruit up off the ground? All kinds of cool stuff. But At the same time, what if can be turned on its head and be one of the worst things that you can think 
when you're trying something new. What if I fail? What if I can't do it? What if I'm not good at this thing that I've always wanted to be good at? It can be paralyzing, and I think quite often it is. And I've seen it a lot recently in out, outside of gaming uh, where uh, a couple people are trying something new and, oh, what if they don't like me or what if they do this or what if – I mean, really, if you think about it, almost all of the fears that haunt us also start with what if. And that got me to thinking. How do you turn what if back from the negative into the positive that it could be and I'm not sure I've come with <laughs> I'm come up with any answers, um, except that sometimes you have to act as if you don't believe the what if that you're sure is true. If you think about it, most of the things you've done in your life were probably at one point impossible for you, or they seemed impossible at least, and then you did them. If, if you think about some of the proudest moments that you've had, they were probably preceded by well, what if I fail? What if I can't do it? What if I'm not good at it? I know pretty much everything I've ever done. Uh, I, I'm I'm kind of a fearful sort of guy deep down inside, and that's always there bubbling along uh, right beneath the surface. And you just have to sometimes, what I do is ignore it, and that's not easy. It's hard, and quite often you think you're ignoring it, when in fact it's actually working against you inside the whole time and uh and so uh it, it's something to be constantly vigilant against especially if you're one of those people who's always thinking on the black side of what if instead of the white side of what if i know i'm usually thinking about the black side of what if. in fact i have to force myself to think oh what if i do this and uh and when i do that something cool will happen but i don't do it often enough and so I'm trying to that's there's a lot of things I'm trying to tweak uh and I it, not like a new year's thing this I uh I started this back in uh December like early December uh when I started to realize that I um it I, well had a lot to do with the novel that I just finished and that was a huge what if and I'm still in the middle of that what if I mean I I finished this novel in a vacuum with no help like in a bad way because it, it I mean I had people that I could have gone to and a lot of awesome listeners have offered whenever I talk about this listeners come back with oh I would love to help you I'd love to be an alpha reader the 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 the, the problem is I'm very 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 self-conscious and I really it, the, anything that I'm uh, until I'm ready to show it publicly I'm ridiculously sensitive about it and so I can only share it with very very few people that I know that I've known all my life that I've really trust. So it it's not a, a negative thing towards anybody who offers because I've had friends like normal in the real world friends. Not that you're all not normal. You're all super normal. Cause what is normal? Normal is nothing. Anyway. Um, and I've had to say, ah, thanks, but uh, I'm all set because, um, I'm super embarrassed to show this stuff until I feel it's as polished as I can get it, which of course it never is, but you reach a point eventually where you just have to deal with what it is. Um, and so it, with this novel, I mean, it was long and, and so I eventually sent it to somebody and he never even responded that he got it. So I'm a little confused about that, but uh, it, like, so what if I, what if I can't finish a, a book that long? What if I can't come up with an idea that I'm not bouncing constantly off, you know, uh, really good editors and, and, and really friendly, um, uh, fiction managers and things like that, 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 you know, that work with me to develop stuff like this. And, um, uh, legacy of shadow was that, but with legacy of shadow, uh, you know, I was working with Wing Tassar and, and Vince and Brandon. Uh, and so and those guys are great. And they're very they kind of know me at this point after all the novels. I mean, we've done six novels. Uh, they've done six novels with me. And so they kind of know where at the point in my creative process, I'm going to start having massive doubts about myself and my product. And, and they're really, really, really good. And I love working with them. Um, 
and I will work with them some more. I'm working with them right now. So it's, it's, uh, it's very exciting. Uh, but at the same time, that other, it's huge and it's heavy. And now that it's, it's gone, I've sent it to a person who, uh, expressed interest in my writing, uh, and asked for a full novel. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, what if, what, what if it doesn't go well? What if he doesn't like it? What if he was just being polite? See, there's a bunch of what ifs. I had to ignore them all. And it was actively ignoring them. And that's what I had to do. Um, joining a new playing group, like a, a new gaming group, playing group. That's, you know, well, you know, you know where my head is. Uh, what if I don't fit in? What Like, you can't think about that. And at the same time now, what I have to do when we're we're all trying to sort of segue into this new store, what if someone comes up to us that we don't know and I'm actively... Normally, act, gaming to me is like a safe space where I'm I'm I, I, I'm with friends and it's kind of like my time to blow off steam. And, and you can't always do that. You can't always have it be that way. You have to be um, open and friendly and bring in new, uh, you know, and be open to new people. And that's not that doesn't come naturally to me either, believe it or not. And so that's where I am right now with. Um, everything that, so I, so what, oh yeah. So the, the book really bore me down. I mean, it was, I didn't have time to exercise all through two, six, 2016. I didn't really exercise. My diet went to garbage. Um, I, I, I was not spending as much time with my family, not spending as much time with my friends. I was focusing on this book, every bit of spare time during the day. Uh, I was is working on this book. So, um, so that's my, my turning over the new leaf is what if I kind of let some of that go and I've really kind of enjoyed it. What if I reach out to other people? What if I don't like, I've got to break out of the isolation that over a year of working on this has, has sort of settled me into, which got me to thinking about all the different what ifs and how they can hold you back. But to bring it back around to the beginning, can also unleash you think about all the different amazing things that have happened throughout history that started with what if and when you start feeling those fears and those thoughts in your head and you hear that voice in your mind oh what if this what if that if you catch it try to spin it and see what you can do because sometimes you'll be amazed at what happens and that's all i've got to talk about today so thanks for listening and Achievement unlocked! You've made it to the end of another D6 Generation episode, the podcast whose humor has universally been acclaimed as not too horrible. Please let us know what you thought of the show by either emailing us at info at the D6 Generation.com or by posting in our official D6G episode thread at the top of the DACA discussions forum on DACADACA.com. If for some inexplicable reason you actually enjoyed this show, you can help others find out about it by leaving positive reviews on iTunes. See you in two weeks. Thanks for listening, and happy gaming. The theme from Total Fangirl comes from the soundtrack of The Last Night on Earth, The Zombie Game, courtesy of Flying Frog Productions, and is a composition of Mary Beth Magalanes. It's about yes. these. So Ebel Skivers mentioned- are little round ball-like pancakes from Scandinavia, right? Yeah. And um, a friend of a uh, friend's, uh, Rika, a friend of Nikki's, she is makes them, and so she has... My wife, she got my wife turned on to these things, and she has an Ebel Skiver pan. And what you do is, it's a batter mm-hmm. similar to pancakes, but not the same. Uh-huh. Um, and you put them in this little, this pan's got these little domed shapes, and you put a bit of the batter in there. Then you put a drop of something in the middle of the batter. Typically, it's chocolate or some form of jam. And lingonberry you, jam, I hear. Lingonberry jam is fantastic. <laughs> my wife has some of that. We got one in Europe. And then you put the, a little more batter on top. And then the tricky bit is you must flip them over in the middle of cooking in these little round domes, and you end up with a ball. It's essentially a little mm. pancake ball, but it's lighter than a pancake. And inside, there there's go. a little surprise. P- sprinkle a little powdered sugar on there, a little maple syrup, and Bob's your uncle. It's delicious. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Bob, does your wife don't you mean Olaf's pictures. your uncle? I was just yeah, adding Olaf. all the different cultural references I could. Ah, okay. <laughs> I'm looking at pictures. Does your wife have these weird hook-shaped fork things for flipping them? No, those are for rookies. You buy no one buys those, <laughs> which you actually use okay. a couple of sticks. So you use a couple she usually uses a couple of little wooden sticks to flip them, like almost like chopsticks. Oh, I've just seen a picture of that. Uh, yes. Okay. So chopsticks cool. are perfect for flipping them over. Yeah. Oh. Listen the, to JJ doing all of his research see, right JJ's there. Got Bang. This. Look at that skill. He's going to be making egg ebble skiffers by the time we're skivers. done recording. Ebble skiffers. There's, got some, th- there's one here that's full of peanut butter as a recipe. Exactly. Oh, oh, there you go. Oh, oh, I'm going to have my wife. There's gonna, the combo right there. I'm going to order a peanut Clash butter one right of now. Cultures. I'm going to go get a peanut butter one. That'd be fantastic. I've never thought of putting peanut butter in an ebble skiffer. That is brilliant. eat your heart out. And peanut butter and jam, right? Get all of that happening. You should try Vegemite, JJ, and let me know how that goes. I Vegemite won't do skin. that, and I'll just tell you now to be terrible. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> well, no. Just, just so, so, save the experiment and go straight to the conclusion. <laughs> just uh, bad. Right? <laughs> just, yeah, there would be a scientific consensus that Vegemite inside an apple skiver is a bad call. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I could no need to use the scientific method. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right.